Well, good morning. The subcommittee will come to order, and the chair recognizes himself for an opening statement. Good morning, and welcome back before the subcommittee, uh, Assistant Secretary Davidson. Good to see you again. Today's hearing is to provide oversight of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, or NTIA, and discuss reauthorization of the agency. Since 1993, when NTIA was last authorized, the communication landscape has changed drastically. NTIA has important statutory obligations to manage federal use spectrum, coordinate other internet and communications functions between the executive branch, and support public safety communications initiatives. NTIA's budget has increased substantially as their duties have grown. Federal and non-federal use spectrum has intensified with the explosion of mobile phones, and improved technologies and cybersecurity challenges have dramatically increased. It is Congress's role, and especially this subcommittee's role, to oversee and authorize the agency's funding and priorities to ensure communications policies continue to benefit Americans and drive our economy. Since our last oversight hearing, NTIA has submitted its 2024 budget request for $117.3 million, nearly double its current authorization. With this new budget request and several other new initiatives being implemented by NTIA, this hearing will serve as the first step in a much-needed oversight and transparency into the agency. For example, NTIA has formalized existing spectrum coordination procedures with the FCC by updating their Memorandum of Understanding, which members of this committee had advocated for. NTIA has also begun implementing several broadband subsidy programs. Today's oversight hearing is the first with NTIA since it has published its Notice of Funding Opportunity or NOFO for BEAD program. These NOFOs include the rules of the road for how these programs would be administered. Getting these rules right is crucial, including technology neutrality will ultimately determine whether all Americans are connected or if they will continue to be left on the wrong side of the <clears throat> digital divide. Today we have 18 pieces of draft legislation to discuss during today's hearing to jumpstart discussion on NTIA's evolving mission and seek feedback from the agency. I'm pleased to be leading the NTIA Reauthorization Act of 2023 to begin a bipartisan discussion on how Congress can ensure NTIA has the statutory tools it needs to fulfill its mission. The NTIA Reauthorization Act would elevate the Assistant Secretary to an undersecretary level, modernize the agency's policies and missions, and authorize its funding to match current funding levels. Other discussion drafts on today's hearing would elevate NTIA's role in coordinating interagency broadband funding and permitting processes, support NTIA's federal spectrum management mission, and reflect NTIA's expertise as a federal coordinator and convener by granting authority to coordinate public safety and cybersecurity policy developments and representation. With the billions of dollars available for broadband deployment being managed by a variety of federal agencies, coordination will be a key to ensuring that money isn't wasted. As the lead agency for broadband, NTA should lead the development of a national broadband strategy. Other components of the reauthorization effort would require NTIA to lead efforts on developing common models, methodologies, and inputs to inform spectrum management decisions, ensure NTIA benefits from the expertise of the commercial spectrum users, and make reforms of federal spectrum relocation processes. I want to thank my colleagues on both sides of the aisle for leading on the initiatives before us. The role of NTIA has drastically changed since it was last authorized. And again, I look forward to working with the agency and the affected stakeholders to update its authorizing statute. Finally, I'm pleased that we are beginning oversight efforts this Congress, which include ensuring that NTIA is being good stewards of tax dollars allocated for broadband expansion, and funds are going for, toward unserved and underserved communities. And I really emphasize truly the unserved and underserved. These oversight efforts will be cru the crucial link to help close the digital divide and make sure all Americans are connected with high-speed broadband internet. Before I do yield back, I want to note for the subcommittee to be effectively uh, conduct its oversight, we do need your testimony within 48 hours of the requirement before we move forward. I look forward to the discussion, and at this time, I yield to the ranking member of the subcommittee, the general lady from the 7th District of California, for five minutes of an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This hearing comes at an important time for NTIA and the future of connectivity. 
The decisions we make over the coming months will have lasting impacts both domestically and abroad. I appreciate NTI Administrator Davison for coming here to discuss them with this subcommittee. NTIA is responsible by law for advising the President on telecommunications and information policy issues. But technology is no longer its own issue. It underpins every sector of the economy and informs everything we do. NTIA's statutory role, speaking on behalf of the federal government on telecommunications and information issues, has never been more important. As I've said many times, it is imperative that the entire executive branch acknowledge and support that responsibility. Unfortunately, we've all seen what happens when these statutory roles break down. We're having this hearing more than two months into a protracted lapse in the FCC's auction authority. It's hard to overstate the economic and national security implications of that lapse. Ensuring the federal government speaks with one voice on spectrum issues is foundational to America's continued global leadership. Look no further than the upcoming CTEL and World Radio Conferences. There is vital work to encourage global adoption of unlicensed spectrum in the six gigahertz band and harmonizing the 3.3 to 3.4 gigahertz bands for mobile telecommunications. And looking beyond that, we all know NTIA will be the tip of the spear for keeping our spectrum pipeline strong. That means ensuring the federal government is a partner, not an obstacle, and making new spectrum available for commercial use. I have two bills on the agenda today that I'm confident will help. First is my Spectrum Relocation Enhancement Act. This bill would make needed updates to the Spectrum Relocation Fund. This fund compensates federal agencies to clear spectrum for commercial use, but for many agencies, the costs outweigh <clears throat> the benefits. My bill would make needed updates to better incentivize agencies to clear spectrum by allowing them to upgrade their technology consistent with their operational needs. My other bill, the Spectrum Coexistence Act, would require NTI to conduct a review of federal receiver technology to support more intensive use of limited spectrum. The FCC recently released a set of receiver principles for commercial equipment, and I think it's important we do the same for federal tech. As new spectrum gets harder and harder to find, updating the SRF and scrutinizing federal technology will help ensure that the federal government is playing its part. I'm also excited to have an opportunity here from Administrator Davidson on the status of bead implementation. Between the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Chips and Science Act, NTIA will be implementing several programs with massive potential. With a June deadline for state bead funding allocations coming up, it is vital that we keep moving forward despite misguided calls for delay. I know unserved constituents in my district are desperate for this funding to get shovels into the ground and connectivity to their homes. This bipartisan program can and should be a landmark achievement for all of us on this subcommittee and look forward to supporting its timely rollout. NTIA is also in the process of implementing the funding I helped secure in the Chips and Science Act to support the maturation of the open RAND market. NTI recently released the first phase NOFO to advance testing and evaluation of open and interoperable networks. We're expecting the first tranche of funding in August. and look forward to seeing the funding being applied quickly. So clearly, there's much to discuss today. I appreciate Administrator Davison appearing before us. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Well, thank you very much. The general yields back the balance of her time. And at this time, the chair recognizes the general lady from Washington, the chair of the full committee, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to start with welcoming the fire chiefs from Washington State, Brian Schaefer, fire chief for Spokane, uh, city of Spokane. But just appreciate all you do. And we are working on getting the next gen 911 approved this Congress. Just know this committee is committed to that, Republicans and Democrats. And also want to welcome Administrator Davidson to the committee. Uh, appreciate you being here today. Uh, you are the Administrator for the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA. 
uh, which is the principal advisor to the president on issues ranging from managing federal spectrum use to working on domestic and international telecom policies, advanced communications research, and strengthening public safety communications. It is responsible for developing a national spectrum strategy, seeking in input on AI and privacy policy, cybersecurity issues, and more recently, running the largest broadband grant program in our nation's history. IIJA created the Broadband Equity, Access, and Deployment, or BEAD program, the Middle Mile Grant Program, two digital equity grant programs, and it gave additional money to the Tribal Broadband Connectivity Program. Altogether, this funding gave NTIA an additional $48.2 billion to administer on behalf of the American taxpayers. These initiatives highlight just how much NTIA's duties have changed since it was last authorized in, or reauthorized in 1993. And the need for Congress to reauthorize agencies whose authorization has lapsed. Reauthorizing agencies in the Energy and Commerce Committee's jurisdiction is a top priority. It is good governance for Congress to consistently evaluate the duties and authorities of agencies within our purview. NTIA has not been reauthorized in 30 years, and I'm pleased that we are making it a bipartisan priority in this subcommittee to change that. The discussion drafts we're considering at today's hearing would modernize NTIA's authorities to come in line with their 21st century responsibilities. Today's hearing is just as much about oversight as it is about reauthorization. Millions of Americans still lack access to broadband services, despite our federal government spending tens of billions of dollars on broadband-related programs over the years. The BEAD program is poised to allocate over $42 billion to every corner of the United States. Americans deserve to know that those resources are being invested effectively and aren't being wasted. We're still waiting to hear about the accuracy of the newest version of the FCC's broadband data maps, and NTIA is supposed to ensure those resources get to the communities that need the most with those maps. We're concerned by reports that the initial version of the maps still miss entire communities and inaccurately stating coverage in many areas. NTIA needs to make sure that those concerns are resolved in the new map before allocating money to states. NTIA also has responsibility to remain technology neutral as investments are made per congressional intent. We need to make sure that these funds meet each community's needs as the geography and use case allows. I was disappointed to hear that certain restrictions in NTIA's notice of funding opportunity would lead to funds being primarily spent laying extensive fiber. Even in areas where alternatives like fixed wireless and, or satellite solutions would, would be better options. While fiber optic infrastructure may be the best option in some communities, especially higher density areas, we cannot forget about the importance of other solutions which can offer connectivity in areas unreachable by fiber. I was pleased that the notice asked entities applying for bead funding to streamline their permitting processes. Permitting reform is a top priority for this committee. It is clear that the current permitting regime in the United States, both at the federal and local level, is not equipped to handle the quantity of projects and resources that the bead program promises. This committee is leading efforts to reform broadband permitting process in the United States to ensure quicker access to broadband. And I look forward to working with you and NTIA to streamline broadband permitting to ensure resources aren't wasted and communications infrastructure is deployed effectively. If we fail to take action now, these projects may not be completed within the deadline and could even stop receiving funds before completion. I look forward to discussing several legislative solutions today to help ensure NTIA is carrying out its mission of strengthening American communications leadership and closing the digital divide. Thank you, Administrator Davidson, for being here. I look forward to our discussion, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much. The gentlelady lady yields back, and the chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from New Jersey, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, the committee is conducting important oversight of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, or NTIA. This agency may not receive as much attention as others, but NTIA has done tremendous work in the last year 
to help connect all Americans to high-speed, reliable, and affordable broadband. And thanks to the historic broadband investments we included in the bipartisan infrastructure law, their efforts have not only have just begun, NTIA will continue to play a crucial role in the years to come to achieve this objective, while also helping advance other cutting edge technologies in a safe and secure manner. Their role is crucial because broadband is no longer a luxury, it's a necessity. It's needed for Americans to do their jobs, run their small businesses, study for school, meet with their doctor for a telehealth visit, and connect with family and friends. Unfortunately, it's estimated that 24 million Americans are still without home broadband internet access. For years, we've discussed ways to bridge the digital divide so that all Americans can take part in today's connected society. Fortunately, last Congress, we delivered for the American people with a bipartisan infrastructure law, which includes a $42.45 billion investment in broadband build-out. And this investment will help us ensure every American has access to reliable high-speed internet. But we know that physical infrastructure alone will not close the digital divide, and that's why we also included the Digital Equity Act as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law. This program will address barriers to broadband adoption faced by specific communities like seniors and veterans who may lack some of the skills needed to fully participate in the digital economy. So I look forward to getting an update from NTIA today on all of these important broadband programs, including those we enacted on a bipartisan basis in the Consolidated Appropriations Act in 2021. Congress has also tasked NTIA with other important responsibilities. These include managing federal spectrum users, coordinating with the FCC to ensure that our airways are effectively managed, and advising the president on advanced technologies. And here we are two months after the expiration of the FCC Spectrum Auction Authority, and I want to once again emphasize the importance of reauthorizing this important program. I'm concerned that this lapse will cause us to lose footing on the international stage. Congress designated NTIA as the manager of federal spectrum, and we must put the disputes of the past behind us so government can speak with one unified voice in spectrum management decisions. And that's why I'm also pleased we're considering a discussion draft from Chairman Latta that will reauthorize NTIA and elevate its leadership in the Department of Commerce. Making these changes will better reflect NTIA's importance to the president and the American people. Given NTIA's enormous responsibilities, I hope my Republican colleagues will not only reauthorize the agency, but also ensure that NTIA is fully funded for the coming year. The Republicans' default on America Act threatens to undermine NTIA's ability to connect communities that have been left behind for far too long. We'll also be considering several Democratic-led bills, including legislation that require NTIA to provide critical data on diversity and equity objectives with respect to broadband programs, as well as closing the digital divide, and legislation to direct NTIA to develop measures that allow federal spectrum users to operate more efficiently and enhance federal spectrum relocation efforts. And we'll also discuss legislation that directs NTIA to assess both the degree to which artificial intelligence systems are accountable to consumers and the value of developing a transatlantic submarine fiber cable connecting the United States, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and countries in West Africa. And finally, NTIA plays an important role in public safety communications, from managing next generation 911 grants to its oversight of FirstNet and its important first responder work at the Institute for Telecommunication Sciences. NTIA is at the forefront of ensuring that the public and law enforcement agencies have a modern and reliable communications network. So it's obviously a lot for us to discuss if we continue our efforts to connect America. And I welcome Administrator uh, Davidson back to the committee. And with that, uh, Chairman Latta, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and we have now concluded with members' opening statements. The chair reminds members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' opening statements will be made part of the record. We would also like to thank our witness for being with us today before the subcommittee. Our witness will have five minutes to provide an opening statement, which will be followed by a round of questions from our members. And our witness for today is the Honorable Alan Davidson, the Assistant Secretary of Commerce and Communications and Information and Administrator of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Can you get that all on a card? <laughs> <laughs> I'd believe, like it to... or not, believe it or not, we do. I can show you later. <laughs> Very small print. <laughs> I'd like to note for our witness that the timer light will turn yellow when you have one minute remaining, and we'll, it will turn red, red when your time has expired. And so at this time, uh, Mr. Davidson, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, 
Well, thank, thank you, uh, Chairman Lada and um, uh, Ranking Member Matsui, members of the subcommittee, good morning, and thank you for the chance to speak with you today. By law, NTIA serves as the President's Advisor on Telecommunications and Information Policy, and we are serving in that role at a historic moment. When I last appeared before this subcommittee, I had just taken the oath of office, the bipartisan infrastructure law had recently taken effect, and much work lay ahead. Just over a year later, I'm proud to report on the progress that we've made toward the bipartisan initiatives that Congress has tasked to NTIA. I'll start with our work to bridge the digital divide. Eight weeks ago, I joined Secretary Raimondo in visiting the small town of Hickory in North, uh, rural North Carolina. There we met with residents who were struggling with little or no high-speed internet service. We met a farmer who told us how he can't take orders online and relies on word of mouth to expand his business without internet access. We met a Boy Scout who couldn't earn merit badges during the pandemic and couldn't complete his homework either. We met a new mom who struggles to run her Etsy business at home. And we spoke with a librarian who told us how so many people in this community were forced to rely on the library's Wi-Fi, the library's Wi-Fi as their main connection to the internet. Stories like these are not new, and many of you know them. We've been talking about the digital divide in this country for over 20 years. But now, thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law and other funding programs, we finally have the resources to do something serious about it. I'm proud of our accomplishments to date on this Internet for All initiative. NTIA has awarded over $2.6 billion in broadband grants, including nearly $1.8 billion to improve connectivity on tribal lands. Every state and territory has applied to participate in both our $42 billion state grant program and our digital equity program. A key goal this year is supporting states and territories as they submit plans for their grant programs. We now have federal program officers providing on-the-ground assistance for every state and territory. As we bridge the digital divide at home, we are likewise determined to maintain our leadership in advanced wireless technology globally. NTIA is developing a new national spectrum strategy to build a pipeline that will meet the needs of both commercial and federal users for years to come. We want to identify 1,500 megahertz of spectrum to study for future repurposing, an ambitious but achievable goal. We also must find ways to allow for more intensive use of this scarce resource. We must do so in a coordinated fashion. And we must account for the future needs of stakeholders and ensure that new uses are balanced with federal operations and do not compromise public safety. And just while mentioning public safety, I just want to acknowledge the representatives of our nation's, uh, some of our nation's first responders who are here with us today, fire chiefs uh, from across the country. And I'll just say I'm intensely proud of the work that NTIA, NTIA is doing to support first responders and to support FirstNet uh, in its work to make sure that first responders always have the connections that they need uh, in an emergency. With all our efforts to bring more people online, we also need to work on building a better internet. One pressing issue is the advancement of artificial intelligence systems. Responsible AI innovation will bring enormous benefits, but only if we address the real risks and harms that it poses. That's why NTIA is seeking public feedback on what policies can support the development of AI audits and assessments to create earned trust in AI. Online privacy is another area where Americans need greater protection. Where you live in America should not dictate what kind of privacy protections you have. The administration has called for a comprehensive federal privacy law, one with clear limits on how companies can collect and use highly personal data. Right now, NTIA is drafting recommendations to address the outsized impacts that privacy and security online can have on poor and marginalized communities. Finally, I've made it a priority to build an organization to meet this historic moment. I welcome today's conversation about modernizing NTIA's existing authority. I appreciate your leadership in ensuring that NTIA's statutory authority and resources are sufficient to do the important work that Congress has entrusted to us. In closing, NTIA has an ambitious agenda to bring the internet to everyone, to support US leadership in wireless innovation, to promote a better internet, and much more that I've detailed in my written statement. Thank you for inviting me to appear today. I look forward to working with this subcommittee to execute our important missions, and I welcome your questions. 
Well, thank you very much for your testimony today, and that will conclude the uh, that portion of our, of our subcommittee hearing this morning. We now begin questions, and I recognize myself for five minutes. Mr. Mr. Assistant Secretary, NTI's mission has evolved significantly since it was last reauthorized in 1993. Managing spectrum has become more important and more complex. The internet has become a component of our everyday lives, and as a result, the demand for broadband access has skyrocketed. That's why I'm leading the NTI Reauthorization Act of 2023. What are the two top challenges you face as the NTI, NTI Assistant Secretary? Top two challenges, yes. Well. Um, First of all, uh, thank you uh, for that introduction. And uh, I would just say, um, as you have outlined, we have an ambitious mission. And uh, across the board, from uh, our historic role on broadband deployment, our work on spectrum, our work on internet policy issues, I would say generally, uh, the biggest issues that we have are uh, really about con resources and continuing to make sure that we are uh, uh, you know, where we need to be to meet this ambitious goal and that we're, and I think we're doing uh, well right now with what we have. And the second thing is um, the need for our partnership, uh, partnership with states to implement the broadband programs, uh, partnership with, um, with other agencies to make sure that we're implementing our spectrum work well. So those are some of the big things I'm focused on and, and especially making sure that we're building an organization that can meet the challenge uh, that Congress has given us. Well, it's our understanding that uh, FCC will release its updated broadband maps in the next week, and that this is the version of the maps you intend to use for making allocations of states participating in the BEAD program. The last version of the map was a vast improvement over the last set of ma maps, but still had significant inaccuracies. How confident are you that these maps will be accurate enough to make uh, making the state allocations? Um, well, thank you. It's, a, it's an important and excellent question. As, as, uh, as you know, good maps are critical if we're going to make sure that we're spending this money well. If we're going to meet our mission of connecting everybody, we need to be spending the money in the right places. And as, as we know, the maps in the past that have been used have not been, have, have been poor. We think that these maps, uh, the map that the FCC is working on now is substantially improved. Much more accurate, much more granular map than we've ever had before. We've been in the middle of a long challenge process uh, where states have been able to come to the FCC and ask for updates to the map. And we've been pushing and working closely with our colleagues at the FCC to make sure those challenges are, are, uh, are, are adjudicated. So um, it's important that we move uh, wisely in how we spend our funds, but also with a sense of urgency, because we know that every week we wait is another week that people are not getting connected. So. Uh, we, we think that the map that will come out, the FCC's map that will come out this June will be a map that we'll be able to use for our allocations, as we've said. Okay. You know, I'm concerned that the notice of funding opportunity for the BEAD program is a, is a wish list of items that conflict with the statute or will increase the cost of the deployment. This seems contrary to your previous testimony before the subcommittee that you acknowledge that a one-size-fits-all approach won't work, and yet the uh, NOFO priorities, uh, certain, uh, prioritizes certain technologies and as a result, uh, you might be picking those winners and losers. These re requirements could undermine the goal of connecting all Americans. Why did NTI include these items? Well, uh, we do believe that this is that there is uh, going to be a need to use a broad range of technologies in the deployment of these programs. And uh, our expectation is that the only way we're going to make sure that everybody is connected is if uh, if there are a broad range of technologies used, fiber, fixed wireless, uh, satellite technologies. And we believe that the, our notice allows states to make their choice about how they're going to, what that mix will look like. Some states will have a heavy preference, perhaps, for fiber. Other states will choose to use much more of a mix. And we believe, and I fully expect, that there will be a broad range of technologies used and implemented under the, uh, under the program. Well, you know, I'm also concerned about the deployment timelines required uh, for the BEAD program, and I understand from provider, providers to have four years to complete projects once they receive their grant, but I'm also concerned that four years would not be enough given the permitting barriers that still exist, labor shortages and supply chain issues and delays that we've, we've talked about. How realistic is the four-year build-out timeframe given these constraints, 
will NTIA be willing to issue waivers to those providers who are delayed because of factors beyond their control? I've got about 10 seconds left. So <laughs> we're keenly watching this. It's a super important question. We are trying to find that right balance of urgency and making sure we can that we're pragmatic. Um, we will be pushing to get shovels in the ground and people connected as fast as possible. And so we are going to keep pushing providers to, to, to hit those goals because we need, know communities need to be connected. We'll be watching to see if there are problems, but our, we're hopeful that people will be able to meet that, meet that mark. Four years at, is, is a fair amount of time to do the implementation. Well, thank you. My time has expired. At this time, I'm going to recognize the gentlelady from California, the ranking member of the subcommittee, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to stay ahead of the rest of the world in wireless communications, we must have a reliable spectrum pipeline. My Spectrum Relocation Enhancement Act would make needed updates to the SRF that will better incentivize federal agencies to clear spectrum for commercial use. Administrator Davison, briefly, do you think allowing agencies to replace their technology beyond just a comparable capability would help encourage federal agencies to make spectrum available for commercial use? It, it absolutely <clears throat> would. And, and thank you for your leadership in this area and with the Wireless Caucus and in this space. You're, you, you said it exactly right. We need to have a steady pipeline of spectrum coming in to meet the needs of the private sector if we're going to keep, and, and the public sector, if we're going to have, uh, continue to be the leaders in the world in uh, wireless innovation. We're committed to that goal, and what you've just said would make a huge difference to, give, to align incentives, to give agencies greater incentive um, to find ways to, sh to uh, make spectrum available. Okay, thank you. Um, the FCC recently adopted a set of principles to promote improved receiver performance to maximize spectrum access and promote coexistence. While this is a positive step, I think it's imperative that the federal government keep pace. Administrator Davison, do you believe re receiver guidance for federal systems can play a role in promoting better wireless coexistence? Right. Well, I'll just say, uh, you know, receiver standards are incredibly important for spectrum management. We've seen that in some of the big recent um, uh, um, debates about uh, key areas of spectrum right. usage. So I'll just say that um, we're doing a lot of work on, spe on receiver performance. The FCC is doing a lot of work in that area. And I'd say further attention would be terrific. Look forward to working with you on, okay. uh, on your efforts. Well, thank that. you very much. Look forward to that also. I was an original co-sponsor of the USA Telecommunications Act and worked to include it in the Chips and Science Act last year. NTI recently issued its NOFO for the $1.5 billion Wireless Innovation Fund, and I'm excited to see this program in action developing the open RAN market. Administrative Davison, in addition to better supply chain durability and network flexibility, what benefits to you do you see for the U.S. with robust open RAN markets? Yeah. Well, um, this is a really important area because we need to have secure, trusted, resilient wireless supply chain. And right now, there are only a handful, really, of uh, major providers for wireless equipment, and not all of them are trusted. Some of them are from our competitors in China, uh, where we have real security concerns. Sure. So um, this effort through, to promote open internet through our Wireless Innovation Fund is critical because what we'll be able to do is catalyze the industry for openness create greater innovation in the wireless industry, promote more security, promote a great competitor, a great comp com competitors out there, and more competitors out there uh, that are trusted. Well, how will supporting better testing and evaluation for open RAN products create opportunities for smaller right. companies to enter the market and compete? Well, and that's exactly a huge part of the point here is that by uh, opening up the stack, you allow smaller competitors to come in and compete for different pieces of it, for the radio, for the controller, mm -hmm. for the computing. And the key to being able to do that is to make sure that they all interoperate. So one thing that we heard loud and clear from, from industry and observers in this space was if we could create good testing, we would make right. it possible for smaller players, new entrants into the market to show our equipment works and you should buy from us. Okay, that's great. Um, the bead program represents the single most effective tool. We have to finally close the digital divide. We owe it to our constituents still waiting for connectivity to move as quickly as possible. Administrator Davison, is the NTIA on track to make state allocations by the end of June? 
Uh, yes I'm or no? I'm pleased to say okay. yes, we are on track. Okay, great, good. Um, NTIA is currently working on a comprehensive national spectrum strategy. This document will outline a government-wide approach to maximizing the potential of our nation's spectrum resources. Administrator Davidson, can you provide an update on the national spectrum strategy and how you see it advancing spectrum access? Yes, very briefly, I'll just say um, we are moving rapid. We are moving out rapidly on a national spectrum strategy. This is something we think will be really helpful to make sure that we're planning and getting a pipeline for years to come. We've put out a request for comment. That request for comment is closed. We got something on the order of 140 comments. We're now writing and working on identifying the particular bands. We've put out this ambitious goal, 1,500 megahertz of spectrum to study. Yes. We're on track to make sure we get that into a study that comes out towards the end of this year. Okay, thank you, and uh, we're looking forward to it, and I yield back. Thank you. Well, thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida's 12th district for five minutes. Thank you. I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and thanks uh, to the panelists for your testimony. There's been, and I will be a lot of, uh, there's a lot of talk about the bead program today, and rightfully so. Uh, it is significant, it's a significant investment and opportunity for Americans to get connected, and my constituents and their local elected officials are very engaged on it uh, to ensure that eligibility under the FCC broadband data maps. So we got to make sure that that's the case. Uh, but my question is, uh, what, what's next? For the first time, there's no additional uh, spectrum pipeline. Stakeholders are looking at a spectrum cliff in the next three years, unfortunately. Meanwhile, countless devices are getting connected, as you know, every day, and new technology is coming online. In some, uh, the, the government needs a spectrum plan before industry can have a plan. Congress is actively working on a renewed spectrum auction authority. We'll be marking that out. Uh, we'll, we'll understand we're gonna be marking that up uh, tomorrow. Is that right, Mr. Chairman? Uh, that's our plan for the future of, of uh, spectrum access. So the question is, what is NTIA's plan for the next steps of America's access to spectrum after the bead funding is distributed? So, sir, if you could uh, please answer that, I'd appreciate it. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so, first of all, on Spectrum, first of all, uh, thank you for the question. Couldn't agree more that we need to have a pipeline of Spectrum available uh, and, in, and, for, in, the, for, and uh, in a predictable way uh, to be working with stakeholders to make sure they know what that pipeline looks like. That is very much why we've created a national spectrum strategy. The first thing I'll say, even before the national spectrum strategy, we do have bands that are people we're looking at and people are working on, um, including, for example, the study that we're uh, working on now with the Defense Department in the what they call the lower three gigahertz band, the 3.1 to 3.45. Getting that study right around that band is very important and has been the subject of legislation. Really appreciate the leadership of this uh, subcommittee and committee in pushing that forward last year. Go, looking further ahead, um, we do need that pipeline and we need to identify it and that is exactly why we've got a national spectrum strategy that we're working on. I would say we've got to be looking not to skate to where the puck is now, but where the puck is going, <laughs> to use the hockey analogy. And uh, um, uh, we've got to hear from the, from the industry and from experts about where their spectrum needs are going to be and how we make sure we're identifying bands. That's exactly what we're trying to do with that spectrum strategy and we're going to move quickly on it. You will see it this year. Thank you, thank you. Next question, historically, uh, programs that have been intended to provide broadband to unconnected communities, particularly our most rural and remote areas, have been inadvertently used for overbuilding already connected areas. What is NTIA uh, doing differently this time to ensure that the nearly $45 billion in BEAD and other broadband grants are being allocated to the right communities? Well, um, we've, we've been given a very ambitious agenda to connect everybody in America. And we strongly feel that we won't be able to do that if we're not using the money wisely. Congress has given us very, very clear direction, and we've taken that direction in how we've constructed the program. Focus on the unserved first, then the underserved, 
And we are building our, we built our notices with that firmly in mind. So it starts with the unserved. States have to use their money for that first. They can't use it for other things. And then, um, and then we go from there. Very so good. that's really been our commitment. And I think you'll see it in our notices. And that's the way we're expecting states to roll out the plans. Thank you. Uh, since redistricting, a significant part of my district is rural uh, in the state of Florida. Uh, people are anxious to get better wireless coverage. And, uh, you know, I see it every day when I drive in my district, uh, the lack of wireless coverage. Uh, so it's underserved. To give you an example of how important it is, one of our local newspapers, the Citrus Chronicle, has, t has had two local news articles on bead funding. And normally you don't get that kind of coverage, but it's so <laughs> very important. Unfortunately, the low power approach taken by CBRS is not likely to provide reliable coverage to my constituents. This is a major concern. How will you make sure that we have adequate spectrum available to support the full power services rural constituents need to deliver high quality, reliable wireless services to rural America? And you know, we're talking about our kids they have to do their homework on our, you know, on a daily basis. So it's definitely a necessity. If you could answer that question, I'd appreciate it. And then I'll yield back. Well, I'll just say very quickly, uh, we, um, this is exactly why we need to have that pipeline of spectrum. Uh, you know, there are many different bands that will be used to make sure that we're getting that uh, variety of coverage on the wireless side. And as you said at the end, you know, uh, we do need to make sure that everybody's got access. Some of it will be wireless. Of course, our bead program, our broadband programs are focused on making sure that there are fixed, you know, connections as well in people's homes. So both of those things are quite important and we're focused on making sure we've got them going. All right, thank okay. you very much. Look forward yeah, to working with you. Gentleman's time has back. expired and the chair now recognizes the gentleman lady from New York for five minutes. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Chairman Lada and Ranking Member Matsui for holding today's hearing. I'd also like to thank Administrator Davidson for being here to testify on these bills and the critical work that you are leading at the NTIA. I was glad to see the Workforce Planning Guide released under the BEAD program call for the development of an equity-driven te telecommunications workforce. My bill, which I'm happy to see the subcommittee considering here today, would help us evaluate how the BEAD program takes steps toward that goal. This legislation will require the NTIA to release demographic data on those receiving funding through the program so we can understand how this funding is reaching communities across the country, including minority and women-owned businesses. Is the NTIA ready already planning to collect demographic data on subgrantees in the BEAD program? And if not, would this present a challenge in implementing? Well, I'll just say, we, first of all, thank you for the question and for your leadership in this space. Uh, you know, I keep saying digital, our digital equity work is the beating heart of our, uh, of our internet uh, and broadband work. Uh, it's really all about how we make sure not just that people have a connection running past their home, but that they have the tools and skills they need, the devices they need to be able to get online, and that we're reaching a broad set of communities. Uh, we are very focused on this, these efforts already. And I will say we're doing a lot of work to make sure we're collecting data on subgrantees and really thinking about, and even more important than who's getting the money, the question of which communities are being impacted. I think the kind of goal that we're pushing for and that you should hold our feet to the fire on is being able to measure outcomes. If money gets spent in a community, we ought to be able to see five years down the road, how, 10 years down the road, how did that impact you know, poverty rates? How did it impact educational levels? How did it impact healthcare outcomes? And that's the kind of data that I think we ought to be collecting uh, and you ought to be measuring our success based on. And so uh, we look forward to working with you on that, on those issues. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk to you, drill down a little bit deeper on that, but thank you for your answer. As a follow-up, how does the NTIA view building a diverse telecom workforce in its implementation of the BEAD and digital equity programs? So um, the workforce is one of the great opportunities here. The president has said these aren't just, this isn't just a connection program. This is a jobs and manufacturing program if we do it right. There are going to be, we think, on the order of 150,000 new jobs created by the, these broadband programs that we're implementing. We wanna make sure that their networks are being built by the communities that they serve. 
and that it's a diverse workforce that's doing so. We've been working directly with states we've, to talk to them about the opportunity in front of them and to encourage them to use their digital equity monies and their be, their be planning grants to think about how they plan for that workforce challenge that's coming and making sure that it's a diverse community of workers. Well, I've long been a champion for protecting vulnerable communities from the harms that come with new technologies. And that's why I wrote my Algorithmic Al Accountability Act to protect against built-in bias in automated critical decisions like algorithms and AI. Recent developments in AI have presented a range of exciting new opportunities, but also grave consequences. I saw that the NTIA recently put out a request for comment on AI, and I know one of the bills we're considering today is Rep Harper's AI Accountability Act. And I agree, we need more guardrails in place on AI, which is why I introduced the Real Political Ads Act earlier this month and plan to reintroduce my Algorithmic Accountability Act and Deep Fakes Accountability Act this Congress. I'm sure there'll be many questions from my colleagues on coordination from broadband funding to spectrum access, but I wanna ask about coordination with AI. How is the NTIA and others at Commerce working across the administration to ensure the federal government's approach to AI, as well as its potential benefits and harms, is harmonized? Uh it's a terrific question. We're, we are focused on this because just as you said it perfectly, there's, there are huge potential benefits here, but only if we're addressing the real risks and harms, real risks that are being faced today. Um, we're part of a comprehensive approach across the administration looking at these issues. Uh, certainly they've grabbed the public's attention, which makes this an actually a great opportunity for us to be addressing this and talking about it with the public and getting uh, people people's input on it. NTI's got a very specific, we're trying to do our part, got a very specific role right now. We've put out a request for comment on how to make sure that AI systems are more accountable and that when uh, you do an audit of an AI system that it actually does what it says it's going to do and what the government could do to make sure that that, uh, to, to, to reinforce that. So we look forward to working with you on that and thank you for your, your attention to those issues. Very, very important right now. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Washington, the chair of the full committee, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Mr. Administrator, I, I represent Eastern Washington, and many parts of my district are, remain completely unserved. I was very disappointed to see in the notice of funding opportunity for the BEAD program that it prioritized fiber projects over other technologies like fixed wireless, Despite language in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IIJA, being very clear that the program was supposed to be technology neutral. While I would love for every constituent of mine to receive fiber to the home, geographic challenges and economics don't, make, don't always make sense. And I fear that with fiber, uh, fiber being prioritized, that many of my constituents will remain unserved and the funding will be wasted. I know you have the authority to issue waivers in certain instances, but states are developing their plans based upon the current requirements. How do you plan to make the determination of what areas deserve a waiver and may use wireless technology? Well, well thank you, uh, uh, Chair, for the, uh, for the question. And I'll just say, you know, we take very seriously the mission we've been given, which is to connect everyone in America with high-speed, reliable, affordable broadband. And we know that the only way we're going to do it is with that all of the above approach. We ex fully expect that in places where it's challenging, there will be generous amounts of other technologies besides fiber. There'll be fiber, there'll also be fixed wireless, there'll also be satellite used. And states will have and are given a tremendous amount of flexibility under our plan to set their own thresholds and take their own approach because what, what Rhode Island needs is different from what Washington states needs. And so I think the, the answer to your question is that states will be given the flexibility, in the notice they're given the flexibility to make those choices, to set that extremely high cost threshold where they need to, to make sure they're getting the right mix of technology. Would, would you approve a state plan that is only fiber, but does not connect every home and business? We have told states that, the top, that they are required to show us how they are going to connect all of the unserved in their states. So we will not approve plans that don't show us how they're gonna connect everybody in the state. Okay, I'm gonna be paying very close attention to this because I, I really do believe that this is a moment. We need to make sure that the, the taxpayer dollars accomplish the goal 
uh, and that uh, my constituents don't remain unserved because fiber isn't possible. Absolutely. Um, I'd also like to move on to the Middle Mile Grant Program, also established under the IIJA. The law did not provide nearly as much speci uh, specificity as the BEAD program, and so it gives NTIA a lot of discretion on how to administer the funding. And I've seen firsthand how a federal, federal investment in the middle mile can yield little to the taxpayers. Uh, just about a, a decade ago, a provider in my district received $138 million, and yet today, you fast forward 10 years, I hear from broadband providers that is, is too expensive to use for backhaul. For the middle mile program, we need to have transparency as to who's applying, where the funding is going, the goals and types of technology. How do you plan to provide funding and track the deployment of infrastructure for the middle mile? Right, uh, it's a terrific question. We uh, really are optimistic about the role that middle mile can play here in the sense that middle mile is sort of a force multiplier. If you do it right, people can use it to build, on, build other networks. And so uh, it's actually important that we're sequencing it the way that Congress has done it. So we're doing middle mile first, and then it will help us with our uh, bead and other state grant deployments. We are in the final stages of putting out our middle mile uh, awards. Uh, and as uh, Secretary Raimondo has said, we'll, we'll have those by the, we're expecting to have them by the, end of, by the end of June. I will say it's a program that we've already talked about as being wildly oversubscribed. One billion dollar program, over six billion dollars in uh, grant requests, many of them very, very high quality. Um, and so that's been a real challenge, it will be a challenge for us. I'm very hopeful that you will have a different experience in Washington State if there's a, is a middle mile. You will see okay. this across the country Thank you. that these will be very valuable. Thank you. I want to get uh, just very quickly to Spectrum also uh, because I know we're preparing for um, the, the World Radio Communication Conference and yep. just wanted to, to ask you what is NTI's role in preparing for the conference and, and if the FCC's auction authority still remains expired, does it put us at a disadvantage? Um, so, uh, quickly, I'll just say, World Radio Conference is incredibly important. Coming up in Dubai this fall, we do it once every four, four years. It's really essential for our, us to have strong leadership at the conference, push back on our competitor, competitors, make sure that we've got our vision of how to make sure the Spectrum pipeline is operating in the future is being put forward in that setting. We've got strong leadership there, um, from experienced negotiators backing them up. NTI is part of the team. It's a cross interagency team, but we've got real experts who've done this before and who are going to be staffing this and helping support the negotiation. And uh, we're going to make it work with, with or without Spectrum Auction Authority, but boy, we really believe that Spectrum Auction Authority is something that would help us. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, the ranking member of the full committee for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Latta. Administrator Davidson, I'm trying to get three questions into you, so if we can give you short answers to each. Uh, you were last before a committee in February of last year, and at that time, the infrastructure law was only recently enacted, and you were just getting started on the job. And I know the agency's been standing up uh, these programs in order to turn the funding into meaningful projects for states and communities. But there's still a lot of work ahead, particularly once the state allocations are made. Uh, you mentioned in your testimony that supporting states and territories is the primary focus of your work right now. But can you describe in a little detail what that means and how the agency is assisting states and local communities as they prepare to receive these funds? So, about a minute or so, because I have two more questions. Oh, yeah, and I could talk about this for an hour. So oh, great. Uh, I'll just say <laughs> that uh, you've hit the nail on the head. This is actually an incredibly important place for us now. The way that these programs are constructed uh, the states get the money and have to do the grants. Different states are situated differently. Uh, uh, the great state of New Jersey uh, may be in a different place than other, other states in terms of their ability and, its, and, and you know, maturity in putting together uh, these programs. The main thing that we're doing is trying to support these states. And the biggest thing we've done is, since I've seen you, is create a program of federal program officers. NTIA staff who sit in the state. Every state has a federal program officer who's there to make sure that they succeed. And that and the technical assistance that we're putting a huge amount of work into hopefully will make a big difference. Well, thank you. Second question is about the tribal broadband program. It's important to me that we not overlook tribal populations, which we know are among the very least connected of Americans. So can you give us an update on that? and how you're working with tribes and tribal governments to make sure they can full, they take full advantage of this program and the BEAD and digital equity programs. 
Yes. Right. Well, the, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the tribal program is, a, is incredibly important. These are communities that have been uh, left behind for years in terms of their connectivity and really need help moving forward. What we've been doing is working, we have a team. Uh, it's largely made up of people who come from those communities. They work really closely with them. And we've given out over $1.7 billion in funding uh, already uh, of the uh, ultimately $3 billion that will be dispersed to those tribal communities. And it's making, I've seen it on the ground, it makes a huge difference for them. All right, then the last thing I want to ask about is Spectrum. Chair Rogers and I introduced the Spectrum Auction Reauthorization Act of 2023 yesterday. And among other things, this bill would improve how NTIA and the FCC work together to manage our airwaves, including reaffirming NTIA's role as the manager of federal spectrum so the government does not repeat past mistakes and can once again speak with one voice on spectrum decisions. So what types of actions have you taken since you started as the Assistant Secretary to ensure that spectrum disputes that we've seen in the past do not happen again? Well, um, spectrum coordination, coordination among federal agencies is absolutely critical if we're going to continue to have leadership, uh, leadership in this area, and if we're also going to make sure that we avoid some of the disputes in the past that have uh, tripped us up. And I'll just say uh, we're working really closely. I made it a huge priority from the start of my uh, term to first and foremost work very closely with the FCC. Uh, we put in place a spectrum coordination initiative. Uh, we put together a revision to our MOU, an MOU that had not been updated, a member of understanding that had not been updated in nearly 20 years. We put that in place last summer, and it's already bearing fruit. Our staffs are working together very closely. I'm in co really constant communication with the chairwoman on a range of issues, but especially on spectrum issues, and that's just the start. The other piece of this is Matt working with the other federal agencies, and we're doing a lot of almost what I'd call shuttle diplomacy, a lot of time uh, sitting with the agencies, understanding their needs, making sure we're coordinated and meeting them. And you think that by reaffirming your role as the manager of Federal Spectrum, that that's going to help avoid these spectrum disputes going forward? Uh, we can hope, uh, and I think it will be, it is helpful for us uh, when it's acknowledged again. We have our, this is our statutory authority. This is our statutory role that Congress has given us. Underscoring it makes a big difference and making sure that, uh, you know, I think we're, we're doing better and better all the time, I think, at working with federal agencies I think some of the recent disputes that have been on the, you know, uh, front pages of the paper have made people realize that we don't, we're not well served, the American people are not well served when the agencies are not well coordinated and the NTI is not playing uh, the role of it's, it's been given. Well, thank you. I thank uh, Chairman Ladder and our ranking member, Matsui. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan's fifth district for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here. Um, connecting rural Michiganders uh, is one of my top priorities. Uh, we've done a lot in Congress to address the digital divide, but there are concerns that with the multitude of programs, unserved areas will still be left behind due to duplication or fragmentation of funds. Uh, to avoid this, we need uh, better interagency coordination, and that's why we're discussing my plan for Broadband Act today which I plan to reintroduce soon with my friend and fellow Rural Broadband Caucus co-chair, Representative Custer. Um, Administrator Davidson, uh, how would a national broadband strategy improve deployment efforts at your agency and across the administration? Uh, well, thank you for the question. I'll start by saying, as, and uh, as we discussed when we had a chance to, to meet last week, um, uh, making sure that everybody is uh, uh, connected to affordable, reliable, high-speed internet service, and particularly in rural areas, is a huge priority and a huge opportunity for us right now. Uh, you know, we are working uh, with with other federal agencies in a way, in a coordinated way, in a way that you know we feel like we've got a strategy moving forward based on the uh, uh, statute that Congress has handed to us, given to us, that lays out very clearly our approach to reaching the unserved first, how we're going to do that. Um, I think it's important for us to make sure that we've got a good strategy uh, moving forward. I think right now we're moving out on the strategy that we have, but welcome the chance to work with you and your, your team, talk to your staff about how we could do better. Yeah, and you know, we look at the, the BEAD program, 
uh, but it, pro it prohibits um, non-fiber projects from receiving funding. Uh, fiber's great. That's what I have to my home. Uh, it's a great option uh, for connection, but it's not the only option. Uh, today, many rural Americans are well served by satellite or fixed wireless uh, because fiber is far too costly to deploy to their homes. I understand uh, NOFO um, includes a uh, waiver request process for states that want to use other technologies, but it seems to be overly complex. Uh, it's burdensome and really not what Congress prescribed. Uh, giving states options but hiding most of those options behind regulatory hurdles is really giving them uh, no or, or little option at all. So let me ask, uh, the NOFO requires that entities set the waiver threshold to use other technologies as high as possible. In fact, it's called the extremely high cost per location threshold. And so how does the NTIA plan to connect rural areas that may not meet these steep requirements, but in fact would be better and faster served by technologies other than fiber? I think states will have, a, first of all, I'll just say it, it's incredibly important for us to be able to connect everyone, and that is our requirement to the states as well. Uh, we'll only succeed in many areas uh, if we have a mix of technologies. There'll be some areas where you'll be able to connect everybody with fiber, with the funding that's given. States will choose to do that. Uh, other states will, will have a mix. I'll just say, uh, under the notice that we've put out, actually, you don't have to, the, the only path, it's not, the, the extremely high cost threshold is not the only path. There are other ways for non-priority broadband projects for other technologies to be included in the mix. Uh, states will also choose where to set that, th that threshold, and some will set it lower. Uh, and we, we have encouraged states to be able to, we're giving states the flexibility to set that threshold where they need to in order to meet their goals. So I think you'll see a range, we'll see a wide range of choices made by states. We're going to support that. Our, I think our notice supports that, and we do fully expect there'll be a range of technologies, including a lot of fiber, but including a lot of other technologies where needed. Well, I certainly would encourage that flexibility, and uh, it, it, as, it, the less complexity as possible to get to that would be helpful as well. Um, let me move on, and we discussed this briefly on, on our phone call, uh, but uh, last Congress, my legislation, uh, the Telecommunications Skilled Workforce Act was, uh, Act was signed into law. It spurred a report that found we'd need tens of thousands more workers to successfully get America connected. If we already have problems filling jobs, don't you think that prioritizing justice-impacted participants and other groups will further delay and increase costs for de deployment? Uh, I'm not sure there's been prioritization like that. We need, we're going to need everyone. We're, this is an all-hands-on-deck moment from our perspective to make sure we're being able to have the workforce that we need. Uh, we're expecting that, that these programs will create somewhere on the order of 150,000 new jobs. We want them to be good, high-paying, safe jobs. Uh, we want them to uh, be in the communities that are where the networks are being built. And it's really going to take, uh, it's going to take a lot of training and it's going to take uh, uh, pretty much, I think it is like an all hands on deck movement to make sure we can meet that, that need. Thank you, my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, the gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas 33rd for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, as the lead federal agency implementing the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law's historic uh, $65 billion broadband investment, NTIA is playing a critical role in making sure that millions of Americans will be able to reap the benefits of the digital economy. And thanks to the $42 billion invested in the BEAD program, we are delivering on our, committed, on our commitment to create a more digitally inclusive and equal society for many generations to come. And as you are aware, Mr. Davidson, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bureau requires that any bead sub-guarantee uh, must offer at least one low-cost broadband service option. Uh, 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 further, uh, states will be required to ensure that services offered over uh, funded networks allow subscribers in the service area to utilize the affordable connectivity program. Uh, and uh, many may require providers uh, to participate uh, in the ACP. Uh, moreover, the existence of ACP, which helps uh, many more customers subscribe to broadband than otherwise uh, would, factors into providers' uh, 
build out proposals and make deployment dollars more efficient. Uh, in fact, one study estimates that the presence of ACP reduces the per person household subsidy required to incentivize deployment by $500 or 25%. Uh, but you probably also know uh, that uh, ACP is slated to run out of money here soon if we don't act. And so I wanted to ask you, Mr. Davison, if Congress cannot uh, come to an agreement to extend ACP funding, will this have a negative impact on BEAD and other broadband programs? The short answer is that it will. And, and you've rightly said, first of all, that affordability is a critical feature here. It's, it's a necessity, not a luxury. And uh, we know providing a family a connection that they can't afford doesn't do them any good. Uh, ACP has been an incredibly important program. We've seen for mi literally millions of American families now are uh, using ACP to make their internet connections available, affordable. And um, uh, we need to make sure that we're continuing the, putting the program on firm footing going forward so that uh, we can meet the affordability needs of those, uh, those Americans. But also, there is this tie-in, and you've noted it, to the, uh, our success in the bead funding. As we make sure, as, as we build out our broadband networks, we want providers to know that there's some certainty that they'll have customers, uh, particularly in these rural areas, particularly in areas where there's lower income Americans, they need to know that those Americans are gonna be able to afford to get online. ACP plays a major role there too. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And uh, I would also like to highlight the fact that over 18 uh, million Americans, as you mentioned, are, yeah. are, are benefiting from this. Uh, and on top of that, last year in May 2022, uh, 20 uh, internet providers, including AT&T, Comcast, Verizon, and then others committed uh, to offering ACP eligible households high-speed internet access for $30 or less. And more importantly, more than 80% of the U.S. population has access to at least uh, one of these no-cost plans. And these families uh, in all of our districts are maintaining a broadband connection now uh, because of the benefit of this program. Uh, I had a second question for you. Uh, the, the bipartisan infrastructure law also allocated uh, $2.75 billion for the state digital equity grant program and the digital equity competitive grant program, uh, programs which will transform the lives, again, of, uh, of, of all Americans. Um, I understand that these programs are still in the important planning stages. Can you elaborate how these programs uh, can help uh, constituents uh, and districts all across the, the country uh, to promote adoption and meaningful use of internet among underrepresented populations, including uh, low-income households, uh, veterans, rural residents, and others? Yes, it's, uh, these digital equity programs are ultimately going to be incredibly important if we want to reach our goal of helping Americans really thrive online. A connection alone, as I was saying, is not enough. If a wire runs past the family's house, they can't afford it, the, the service that doesn't do them any good. But even if they can afford it, if they don't have the tools they need, if they don't have the training they need to be able to, to thrive online, none of this work that we're doing really matters. So at the end of the day, part of what we are really focused on with these digital equity programs is making sure that people have the tools, they have the skills, and that we're reaching these communities, many of these communities that have been uh, traditionally disadvantaged in the space, the poor, the elderly, kids, all of this uh, is being done by the states now, and the, even though we're in the planning stages, I'm very proud of the work that states are doing right now. By the end of this year, every state in America will have a digital equity plan that's gonna be a requirement of getting these grants. And uh, we've never had that before. So wow. we're really looking forward to seeing those plans and how states are gonna address these big digital equity issues. That's awesome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, the gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, the vice chair of the subcommittee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Davison, and thank you for reaching out um, yeah. a couple of weeks ago. And it's very obvious you take your job very seriously, and we appreciate your, your dedication. You know, in the last 30 years, technology has evolved like we never imagined it would have, and, and yet it's been 30 years since the last reauthorization of NTIA, so <laughs> it just shows you that we need to get this done. We need to... Um, it needs to be modernized and it needs proper oversight. NTIA and the Institute of Telecommunication Sciences, they not only manage federal use spectrum, but they also establish the models and, and then the testing that are used to inform interference analysis determinations. Now, I know the discussion a little while ago was that we don't want a cookie cutter 
uh, approach and that the states need to have some, some leeway, but I think you would agree that this is a very technical process and it's important that NTIA sets the, the common methodologies, if you will, and inputs so that spectrum policy decisions are, are data-driven and they should be. Um, and, and there's a common, and they're based on a common understanding of fact. One of the discussion drafts that um, is before us today would require NTIA to establish these common methodologies and inputs for any interference testing that may be performed. Can you, can you speak to the importance of, um, of having NTIA establish common methodologies and inputs for interference testing? Uh, thank you for the question, and this is actually something that's very important. If you, we need to have as a starting point a spectrum policy that's evidence-based, that's science-based, right? Uh, so that when we have disagreements about, you know, how different uses of spectrum might interfere with each other, we have a common baseline for understanding um, whether that's true or not. And believe it or not, it's, it, it, it often is hard to get to that, that factual basis. I'm very proud of the work that's being done at our in Institute for Telecommunication Science out in, in Boulder, as you rightly know. They were, for example, instrumental in the, some of the scientific research that went into understanding the questions around uh, altimeters and uh, 5G networks and some of the potential interference there. And I, I, we believe, I think that our work really was instrumental in, in helping make sure that we had a, could come up with a solution to that, uh, that issue. Um, so I'll just say this science is important and investing in it is important. We appreciate your leadership and help in doing that. You, you know, probably most people watching this are wondering why does all this matter? And, right. and but it does matter. It, it matters. And, and and can you discuss the importance of um, how important it is for our economy and and the yeah. technological innovation that NTIA's technical expertise continues to be? Uh, it continues right. to be the foundation for federal spectrum management decisions. I, I totally appreciate the question because I think probably Amer many Americans don't realize how big a role that these that spectrum plays in their life you know we are I, so used I agree to with that. the fact that you know these cell phones they they just work right and um, they're amazing they're they're kind of a wonder of the modern economy from our cell phones where we're getting you know streaming video now on our phone to um, you know weather prediction that relies on weather satellites to all you know to all sorts of new you know mobile applications that we're seeing in our cars um, Spectrum plays a huge role in our everyday life and it's getting bigger and bigger. So we need to make sure that we're managing this scarce resource really well because it is a scarce resource. We're making sure it's getting to the right people. Uh, aviation safety, national security, all of these things depend on ac ac you know, access to, to Spectrum. So it's hugely important that we get it right. It's behind the scenes. Most people, we, people shouldn't have to worry about it, but they should know that it's important that we get it right. Good. Let me ask you, the, the Build America, Buy America regulations that were introduced in AIJA, they require grant funds expended in the B program to be Buy America compliant. Um, but at this time, there's only one fiber manufacturer that meets these standards. Are you concerned? Are you concerned that a nationwide $42.5 billion grant program that prioritizes fiber development will be stalled for a lack of available fiber? Um, so I uh, really appreciate your question. We're very focused on this issue of making sure that we've got an adequate supply chain. Uh, this is not just a connectivity program. It's also a, a jobs and manufacturing program. We want to make sure that if we're spending federal money, we're doing everything we can to make sure that it's being spent in the U.S. and supporting U.S. jobs where we can. We also know that telecom networks are really hard to build and that there are things that are going to be difficult to do in that rubric. So. Uh, we're going to be looking for, as we have in our other programs, how to set, a, how to create a waiver uh, for some of those requirements. But that the bar for those for that waiver has to be high, uh, uh, and we're going to keep pushing to make sure that there is manufacturing on the fiber piece. I'm proud. I'm pleased to say the fiber manufacturers are stepping up. I was in North Carolina. I visited two fiber companies, Comscope and Corning. They're making new manufacturing lines to meet the needs of the uh, programs that we're putting out, put to create new jobs. Uh, and that's exactly what we should be doing, Pull, pushing companies to invest in America where we can, and then we'll figure out how to make sure that we can build our Well, I'm encouraged to hear that as well. So thank you again, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida's 9th District for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Last term, the Congress had the audacity to put up a bold goal, which is to make sure that every American would get access uh, to the internet, much like we saw in the 1960s with efforts to bring electricity uh, to every household across the nation. Uh, in modern America, not having internet means you're left in the dark. It means that kids don't have the access to be able to do their homework, small businesses, uh, lack the access to be able to thrive, and this has been an inequity in uh, many rural areas across the nation for far too long. And so we came together, many of us, to pass the bipartisan infrastructure package with $65 billion for broadband investment, including $42 billion for the BEAD program. I'm excited to see that Florida's base allocation is $247 million with potential of up to two billion um, by estimates of uh, a lot of our nonprofits. And we're already seeing even before that, the American Rescue Plan adding in some key funding uh, for our area, including uh, 11, or excuse me, 15 million for two projects uh, in rural areas like Keenansville, Deer Park, Bull Creek, and Yeehaw Junction in our district. Uh, and I'm excited to see local governments working with our local internet companies uh, to ensure we get every Central Floridian internet access. Uh, charter and communications in particular have stepped up with our local folks. Uh, Assistant Secretary Davidson, how has Florida been to work with so far on their BEAT application? Uh, first of all, I'll say uh, thank you for, for your, your statement there. I, you know, we do feel this is a once in a, a generation opportunity to connect everybody. We, we, uh, haven't been given these resources uh, to do it before. We, we recognize we probably won't be given them again and we have to get this right. Working with the states is really a, an essential part of that for us. And uh, uh, we've seen from the beginning, known from the beginning, that the way the program is constructed, the states are going, that our success rises and falls on the success of the states. And we are committed to making sure that every state, including Florida, uh, and other other states that are going to have that have big rural populations that need to get served, we need to make sure that states like Florida succeed. And so, uh, the biggest thing we've done is invest in staffing to make sure that we're there for the states. That we have somebody in every state. We have somebody in Florida uh, who's there, wakes up every day thinking about how Florida is going to succeed, and that the state has a kind of customer service rep at NTIA that they can go to. And we're making sure we're also moving out on good technical assistance to make sure the state can meet these goals. And we're optimistic that it'll happen. Uh, the equity provision has been discussed quite a bit. It, yeah. Is the current application up to par on the equity needs that we're going to need to satisfy for the Sunshine State? Um, yeah, I think that Flor I know that Florida has gotten its uh, digital equity planning grant. It was over two million. I think probably around two and a half million dollars. Uh, as I said, as far as, as we know, we're on track and it, the expectation is, the requirement is, that Florida will have a digital equity plan by the end of the year. We know broadband is going to be a key part of it. This committee is also taking a lot of time to talk about uh, other types of internet access like cellular and satellite. How do you think we'll evolve over the next five, ten years when it comes to something like internet, uh, satellite internet like we uh, launch every week from Cape Canaveral uh, with, uh, with SpaceX. Uh, where do you see that going over the next 10 years? It is incredibly exciting to see the innovation that's happening um, in, in satellite communications, across the communica board on communications. Satellite is a particularly exciting one, and it's wonderful to see uh, what we're able to provide now, both in um, internet communications, broadband that was being provided by satellite, even now handset to satellite communications, which is an ex exciting new area. It's kind of incredible, and as a computer scientist, I would say, or fallen computer scientist anyway, I would say that uh, we've, um, it, it's almost like a modern miracle. You would, if you say, said to people 20 years ago that we would be doing these things that we're doing today, I think people would, would have been really surprised. So uh, I'll just note that um, uh, there's gonna be a lot of innovation that keeps coming. We're watching that, and we're going to make sure that it's part of our programs as we roll out. Well, we appreciate your excitement and vision for it. There are places in rural areas of our district where there's cattle, citrus, hunting leases, conservation lands, and 
I have been pleasantly surprised by how needed the internet is in these areas for these rural businesses to, to stay competitive. So appreciate your commitment to that, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida's second district for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, the uh, NTI's uh, 24 ask is 77% increase. Uh, so let's review a couple of programs. Uh, Secretary Davidson, 42 billion for the uh, BEAD program passed with good intentions, uh, but we must use these funds wisely. Uh, we, we all know the last mile deployments can, can help underserved and unserved areas, but the grants uh, on, uh, rely on the, the quality of the maps, the FCC's broadband maps. Uh, so the NTI uh, asked the public to submit the challenges to the maps by the 13th of January. Uh, several states and members of Congress have asked for NTI to push that date back. Uh, uh, I have a letter on that that we would like to submit for the record, Mr. Chairman. So. Without objection. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so stakeholders in my district have contacted my office to express concerns with the initial round of the maps. I just want to make sure that we ensure that we're all doing the right thing for the rural and underserved communities. Uh, uh, the letter that we signed, I referred here, was signed by 18 members of uh, Congress. And uh, it's just we asked for a delay on those maps so that you can get better data. Uh, uh, first question, will the NTI reconsider allowing more time to evaluate the maps? Uh, well, Congressman, I, first of all, I really appreciate the, uh, what you're, the, the, the impulse here that uh, maps are incredibly important. Uh, as I said earlier, we've got to get the maps right, otherwise we're not spending our money wisely. We want the maps to be very good. We also know that we need to move out with some urgency here because every week that we wait on those maps is another week that we are not giving the states their money, another week that we are not connecting people with the broadband that they need. So our, we had said eight, eight months ago, we said that we were going to make these allocations in June. Uh, we're still on track to make them in June. And I think that when people uh, see the new FCC map that's coming out. I'm, I'm just afraid the that there may be some blowback if we make some terrible mistakes. And people are going to see some injustices, I think, in these things. Yeah. I know that some of the areas my, that I would have talked to in my district are least served. And they are the ones that would like to have the maps yeah. uh, Looked at again. So let me move on. Uh, last week, a group of us here on this co uh, co committee went to see a demonstration of Starlink, uh, which showed a high quality, reliable service, uh, suitable for broadband use and streaming things and whatnot. And, uh, you know, it was very impressive. I think we all know how important that has been to the Ukrainians fighting for their freedoms and their lives. Uh, so I think there's many similar uh, technologies that uplink directly to satellites and provide broadband connectivity. And I think that the federal broadband deployment should, you know, it, it seems to be all grants for, for fiber. We need to open the aperture and be a little more technology agnostic so that we can pick things based on what works where. Uh, I know uh, you could just drop a star, like I know this in Ukraine, you could just drop a star like and, and start having, uh, I guess they could watch movies if they would use them that way, but they don't they tend to do other things with it. Let me change subjects. I, I want to briefly uh, uh, commend my colleague, Mr. Soto, who just spoke. Um, he and I sponsored the Launch Communications Act, and, uh, and uh, it's passed this committee in March. Uh, that's an act that was a huge step forward for commercial space launches and re-entries. They rely on the NTI secretary, you, as in, in this case, to coordinate uh, regarding access to frequencies needed for the launches. Uh, it's imperative that we continue to lead in the satellite communications and space exploration uh, businesses. So uh, in the free frequencies that are used for launch and reentry control is a serious bottleneck to launches. And uh, so I would uh, like to ask you, wh what takes so long to allot those uh, frequencies for each launch? You know, just starting point, I'll just say uh, we are incredibly excited about the opportunities around uh, commercial space exploration and uh, making sure that we are supporting that across is an administration priority. It's an priority for our for the Commerce Department, and we are doing um, a lot to make sure that we're doing what we can to, from the NTI's perspective, to support all the spectrum needs that are out there. And it's not just about launch, of course. There's other things. Uh, in terms of the specifics on 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 the on the uh, launch. Uh, 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 spectrum. 
happy to get back to you. I don't have a good answer for the, the exact it, question about the delay. So I, it seems to be what we, we're launching now two right. and three times a week. I think it's right. time to just give them a spectrum that they can use uh, for for launch, uh, re-entry, and uh, well, launching know, and re-entry. I know it's a strong, it, we have a strong desire to make sure we're supporting the needs of that community, and I'd be happy to t work with you and your staff, talk to you more about uh, any delays that are out there. There's a very, very high interest in this in the satellite community generally, I, I, I assure you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentle lady from California, 16th District, <laughs> for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and to the our ranking member, uh, Congresswoman Matsui, and thank you, uh, Mr. Davidson. It's great to see you here. Um, I have um, uh, uh, three areas of questions, spectrum, broadband funding, and um, AI. It's been 75 days since uh, the spectrum authority expired, 75 days. Um, You've spoken to it. Almost every single member has brought up the issue of spectrum. And I have to say that uh, I am really deeply disappointed. Deeply disappointed. I don't know if there, with each day, it's a chipping away at uh, a sense of urgency on this. It's expired. It's expired. And, you know, uh, uh, spectrum is the gold in the 21st century. Nothing moves without spectrum. So what is it that you can um, uh, tell us that will give us some hope that real hard negotiations are going on? This has to be resolved. I mean, the private sector is really getting screwed and tattooed. Uh, but, you know, I mean, overarching, uh, it's shameful for our country to have, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to have this uh, be marking every single day. 75 days. 75 days is a lot of days. On uh, broadband funding, um, uh, tell us what you think the single biggest obstacle is to getting uh, uh, the money out on schedule. I think you can... Uh, uh, you know, handle that one. And on, uh, on AI, I know you have the request for comment. Uh, together with uh, uh, Michael McCall, um, we co-chair bipartisan uh, uh, AI caucus. Uh, when will we get uh, the comments that uh, you've requested? When will Congress get to see what uh, the input is? So uh, those are my comments and my Questions uh, and uh, thank you. As my mother would or my father would say, what do you have to say for yourself? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, first, thank you for those questions and thank you, as always, for for your leadership on all these issues over the years and your partnership and support uh, for NTIA is really appreciated. Um, on the on the auction authority, all I can say is, you know, um, the nation benefits enormously from having that. Uh, Spectrum Auction Authority at the FCC. Um, you know, it, it's essential to continue but, that uh, uh, Alan, we know that it is. Yeah. These are all wonderful things that you're saying, and we agree with you. Yeah. But that's why I'm so upset about it. Well. Because of the importance that you just described. Right. And, and you should be concerned, I would say. And ultimately, ultimately, this is in Congress's hand. We stand ready to do whatever we can to support that and to help push that forward. Um, but I, I, I agree, this is a topic of great urgency and we hope that there'll be action. Um, on the issues around broadband, I would say the single biggest thing that we're quite focused on now is the move to the states, right? We're going to make our allocations by the end of June. States will know how much money they have. The shot clock starts. They have six months to put in their plans. They have a big homework assignment because we're not gonna write large checks. We shouldn't write large checks without understanding how people are gonna spend the money. I know the states are hard at work on that, um, and your help, your partnership generally, this subcommittee's help in partnering with state, uh, us and with the states to make sure that they're getting their plans in and that those are good plans that, are in, you know, uh, that work with the statute is gonna be really important. So that's the biggest thing we're focused on and building out on that, and you, 
We really appreciate your help. These individuals that you've uh, uh, dispersed to the states, uh, can you tell us who they are so that it's, it's maybe actually our on our it's on our website. If you have it's on our website, you oh, can find okay. out who the state federal program officers are. You can also um, just reach out to us. Okay, we'd be happy to Good. tell you there's two in California actually, and they're both in Sacramento. Well, we are a nation state. Yes. Uh, right. <laughs> um, and the other thing I'd say is you had asked about AI, and uh, just I'll very quickly say thank you for your leadership with the caucus and um, on these issues for some time now. We're only going to, you know, we're only going to uh, be able to get this right if we're dealing with the risks and the benefits here. Very excited about this request for comment that we've put out and the reaction. When is Congress gotten. going to get the it, comments? It's, um, so the comments are due June 12th, I believe. Uh -huh. So just a few weeks from now. Okay. They'll be up on, you know, through our. We do a quick filter to make sure there's uh, no dirty words in there, and then we will be happy to share them with not just with you but with the public. Thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes five minutes the gentleman from Utah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Davidson, uh, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I've uh, listened with interest to my colleagues talk about the uniqueness of their districts. <laughs> I, I can't help but weigh in on this. I have uh, <laughs> over 400 miles top to bottom. Um, <laughs> probably no more diverse landscape than we have uh, in eastern Utah. And as a matter of fact, they talk about uh, rural. I actually have half of my district is frontier, and um, and much of it is, is rural. So your your success is very important uh, to, to us and to my district. And so perhaps because of that, there's great frustration um, when it seems like other federal agencies that might be unhappy with you or FCC spectrum decisions go what I would call rogue and um, use um, strategies of crisis to hang on to allocations or delay uh, transitions to commercial use. It's got to be a frustration to you. It's a frustration to the committee. Imagine the frustration to the companies who have invested billions and billions of dollars um, so that they can move the interest of our, of our country forward. And quite frankly, in many cases, probably have more ability to solve these problems that these, that these federal agencies are, are, are complaining about than the agencies do themselves. It seems like it's frequently last minute. We're not getting enough leadership from the White House. So my question to you is, um, what are you doing uh, to work through this with other agencies at NTIA, and, and what recommendations would you have for the subcommittee? And really, basically, we've got to have these other agencies understand that, that you and FCC are the last word. And I'd just be curious to know what your recommendations are. Well, I really appreciate that question. Um, as you can imagine, uh, look, we, we have this dual imperative. We serve as the coordinator for federal spectrum. We also are the president's advisor on these issues and so feel real strength, a uh, real strong tie to the need to make sure we have a pipeline out there as we've spoken about already today, uh, pipeline and spectrum. It's hard to do that um, because, you know, this is a scarce resource and, and the low-hanging fruit is gone. So uh, there are no, you know, fallow bands just waiting to be reassigned. So in that, in that setting, it means that everybody has to uh, roll up their sleeves and do the hard work of coordinating together and figuring out where we can find opportunities for repurposing and greater sharing of, of, of resources. Uh, Coordination is really important in that. Uh, we, the main thing that we're doing is, is, is investing in the strength of that coordination, working very closely with the FCC. We have a new MOU with the FCC about our operating procedures. We're working with our sister agencies uh, to make sure that we've got good connectivity with them, that we're building our relationships with them and promoting this. And I think some of the high profile, some of the high profile problems we've had have actually sort of reminded people that this isn't the world we the better, we, we can do better. And right. the last thing I'll say, you asked about the subcommittee, I really appreciate that. You know, doing things that reinforce regular order and how this is supposed to work are really important. The work the subcommittee, the, 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 the uh, last year, um, in last year's legislation, the Spectrum Innovation Act, uh, to reinforce uh, a return to regular order on how we study the lower three gigahertz um, uh, uh, spectrum band, those kinds of things really matter. People pay attention. And so your help is really, okay. really important. Thank you. And appreciate, uh, appreciate that answer. Uh, you're currently working on to develop an incumbent informing c uh, capability. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Guthrie's legislation, the Smart Spectrum Act, would provide direct statutory authority for this capability. Uh, can you explain why that's important for your agency to do that? 
yeah. Um, well, as I said, uh, and I'll say it quickly, you know, the, the, the low-hanging fruit is gone. We need to find new innovative ways to share spectrum. Uh, IIC, the incumbent informant capability, is actually a terrifically exciting new possibility about how we can do better sharing uh, better and get more use out of the scarce resources that we have. So we're excited to, we, would, we welcome the chance to uh, work with you more on that because I think making sure that we've got the ability uh, as a federal government to invest in that, those kinds of new tech sharing technology is gonna be important uh, if we're gonna meet the challenge of, in the future. Um, finally, I'd like to just emphasize the point of this agnostic to technology uh, concept. And my district is probably no better example where you simply can't get fiber uh, everywhere in the district and we're dependent on these other technologies. Yeah. I think that there, uh, I, I suspect uh, that there were, as I, as I say, when I think about just places where there will be a healthy mix of technologies, it's exactly pro the kind of district you're describing, right? Area you're describing. And we wanna get fiber out as far as we can to the, because we wanna give every American the best uh, 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 internet connection they can have. But we know that in challenging geographies, it's going to be a, yeah. a broader mix. And I'm yeah. glad we have those technologies to, to rely on. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield my time. Thank you, the gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California's 29th district for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and also ranking member for holding this uh, very important committee. Appreciate you, Mr. Uh, Administrator Davidson, for coming to enlighten us today about what's really going on out there. <laughs> and also thank you for your public service I uh, really, really appreciate you. Uh, the Broadband Equity Access and Development Program, otherwise known as BEAD program for short, was established by the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law to invest more than $42 billion in bridging the digital divide across America. The BEAD program, which is administered through NTIA, is intended to close the gap in access to broadband by providing grants to states and territories to build broadband infrastructure so they can deliver high-speed, reliable internet connections to underserved and underserved communities across the country. Last week, I introduced Improving Broadband Mapping Act. The goal of this legislation is to help build an authoritative source on the state of the digital divide in the US so that we can have better awareness of where things stand as we make strides toward closing the gap. Specifically, this bill would make improvements to the indicators of broadband need map a resource NTIA offers to states to better understand local broadband availability and highlight socioeconomic data that may suggest challenges. Administrator Davidson, can you talk about how an improved indicators of broadband need map would help policymakers address broadband barriers other than just physical infrastructure? Uh, well, thank, thank you for that question and for highlighting the importance of, um, of getting good data in this space, uh, the, uh, this is a once in a generation opportunity as we know, making sure that we're deploying, spending our resources, deploying our resources in the right places and then measuring outcomes is incredibly important to us. Uh, uh, this is, some of this is work that NTIA is already doing and um, uh, some of it's work that was uh, uh, put forward in the Access Broadband uh, Act. Um, I'm glad to be glad to brief you and your team more on the, our efforts to date. Uh, uh, this is an important area. I look forward to working with you uh, as you put forward your legislation to make sure we're uh, uh, supporting you. So more improved and more accurate maps is critical to our success as a country. Absolutely. Okay. We need to we need to spend the money in the right places and measure how uh, how it how how it makes people's lives better. Thank you. While expanding broadband networks is vital to bringing more communities online. Uh, it's just as important to make access to broadband affordable so that families across the country can get online and stay online. The Affordable Connectivity Program has been hugely successful with over 18 million eligible households participating in the program across Democratic and Republican districts combined, both urban and rural throughout the country. However, it's estimated that the program's funds will run out as soon as possibly March of 2024 the ACP is playing a critical role in helping to close the digital divide by connecting families to the internet and giving them the means to stay connected. Our goals for these programs will uh, be frustrated if families in our districts cannot afford to maintain a consistent broadband connection from month to month. How will extending the ACP program further the goals of NTIA's BEAD program and continue its success? 
Uh, well, I, I couldn't say it better, uh, sir. Um, affordability is critical if, to our success here, and ACP has played an, uh, an essential role in recent years in making sure that we've got affordability and in internet access. Um, you know, having a connection to somebody's home doesn't help uh, a family if they can't afford to get online. Affordability is a necessity, not a luxury here. Congress has instructed us to make sure that we're building affordable, reliable, high-speed internet service. So um, programs like ACP, now relied on by millions of people, are an essential part of that. We won't be able to reach our goal of affordable networks without it. And the other thing that's quite important here is the, our deployment programs do better if ACP is on a firmer footing because it gives people, providers the confidence that there will be consumers, that low-income Americans will be able to get online, and that's incredibly important. Thank you for that feedback. Administrator Davidson, recently NTIA released a data drive report demonstrating that the CBRS spectrum sharing model is working. In your view, why is this approach so promising and why are spectrum sharing approaches so important to the future of spectrum policy? And could the CBRS approach be ap uh, replicated in other spectrum bands? Right. Um, well, for thank, thank you for highlighting that. I'll say very just very briefly that uh, we've got to find innovative new ways to make better use of spectrum if we're going to meet our future spectrum needs. It's a scarce resource. Sharing is really one of the interesting and innovative and exciting new things that's happening in this space that has proven to be very successful. The study you mentioned showed a 120% increase in the number of devices on these, in these, using these share, the sharing platform. So we're excited to see uh, how it rolls out in the future and where we might be able to use it in other places and invest, invest in other kinds of sharing. So I think showing that sharing works is really important for our spectrum future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Joyce, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening today's hearing on oversight and reauthorization of NTIA and the role that they play in closing the digital divide and ensuring that all Americans have access to fast, reliable broadband. And thank you, Assistant Secretary Davidson, for testifying here today. Connectivity is truly the key for success. The demand for fast and reliable internet access has grown and the need is especially prevalent in rural areas, just like mine in South Central and Southwestern Pennsylvania. Similar, Mr. Davidson, to what you uh, acknowledged in your recent visit in your opening statement. Rural Americans often lack accessibility to this critical tool because of the lack of infrastructure. Since coming to Congress, bridging the digital divide has been a top priority of mine. Yet the problem remains that these communities are often overlooked and underserved. There has been concern about the accuracy of the FCC broadband maps, especially as it relates to the BEADS program funding deployment. Very simply stated, a poorly developed final map can and will undermine the potential success of the BEAD program. <coughs> Mr. Davidson, the Broadband Data Act places mapping efforts at the FCC, yet NTIA continues to produce its own national broadband map. You just said we need to spend money in the right places. How does your map differ from the FCC's, and why should Congress continue to fund that map? Well, it's a very good question. So uh, first of all, as you rightly said, uh, mapping is essential here uh, over t uh, uh, to, make, to ensure that we're spending our money, uh, the taxpayers' money, uh, properly, that we're good stewards of those funds. Uh, the FCC is creating the map that is the authoritative map that we will use for the um, uh, BEAT allocations and for state that states will use as the basis for how they're going to spend their money. We've created over time other kinds of maps, uh, uh, and I think we are constantly looking at where we can <laughs> deprecate our maps, where they're no longer needed, but also to look at and understand where um, understanding, for example, the impacts of digital equity. Uh, we are collecting a lot of data about the outcomes of, uh, of our broadband investments, and so there are layers to these maps um, that are not duplicative, and we will continue to make sure that where maps are needed, we'll continue to invest in them. Where they're not, we won't. We won't. I understand that the maps that will be used to calculate the bead funding allocation for each state will not be the same maps that are used by states to conduct their state challenge process. Yeah. 
Are you concerned that the difference between each variation of the map could lead to certain states being overfunded and others being underfunded? Uh, that doesn't, it hasn't emerged as a big issue so far. Uh, the, we are going to keep a close eye on it. The difference is just that states are given some, states are required under the statute to run their own challenge processes after uh, allocations are given to make sure that they are being as accurate as possible in their process. So there will be further refinements based on the FCC map. I agree that our hope is that the FCC map will be the main source of truth. But we do want to give states the flexibility to add their own data on top of it and make sure that they're also making that map better. And I appreciate that oversight because I think it is apparent to us here that we need that oversight to make sure that the funds are placed in the right situation. Yeah. Given that the states are responsible for awarding and administering the bead funds to entities within the state, what is NTIA's role in oversight of those funds? Um, we're making sure that states do a lot of homework <laughs> uh, before we um, give them their final grant. So there'll be two bites at the apple here. States have to present uh, us an initial plan that describes how they expect to spend their money. They'll then do their uh, grant making, and then they'll present us with a final plan. We feel it's very important that we not just, uh, that we not just write a, hundred millions of dollars of checks, billions of dollars in some cases, to states without a plan. And so we're going to be looking at those plans. We've given the, it's a pretty detailed plan that we're expecting that shows how they meet the requirements of the statute. And that's going to be our main uh, way to make sure that states are spending the money wisely and consistently with Congress's direction. And I appreciate that analogy you made that you've given that homework assignment. But before that final grade, before the awarding of those millions and billions of dollars that you just mentioned, Let's make sure that those maps are accurate before federal funds go into these programs. I thank you again for being present today, and Mr. Chairman, I yield. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Dingle, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you to you, Chairman Lada, and ranking member for holding this hearing. I'm going to agree with all of my colleagues because I've got a lot of questions. I, I think the point that everybody's making is that the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act has made a once-in-a-generation investments. We want every American to have access to broadband, and you play a central role in making that happen. Um, and a lot of people are worried about it because it's our constituents that need to get that access. Right. Let's start with privacy. For starters, the Energy and Commerce Committee has worked diligently in a bipartisan manner to enact comprehensive data privacy legislation that will guarantee vital protections for every American. Uh, they're desperately needed. In your statement, you mentioned NTI's work on the intersection of privacy and civil rights. Could you talk a little bit about the work that is currently going on in privacy and is a federal privacy law needed? Um, well, I really appreciate that question. And the starting point, of course, is that um, everyone in America deserves to have their privacy protected. The president has said that we need to do more to make sure that we've got a comprehensive uh, uh, federal privacy law, baseline privacy law that protects everybody, and it shouldn't uh, matter which st what state you live in, uh, whether you cross state lines, we need, a, we need that comprehensive federal law. Uh, NTIA is trying to do its part here, too, because what we've learned uh, from listening to stakeholders and people out in the communities is that um, privacy and security concerns have a disproportionate impact on vulnerable communities, the poor, the elderly, children. They suffer more uh, when their privacy is being violated. They are less well situated to protect their privacy. So the work we're doing is about how to put recommendations in front of Congress, in front of enforcers, to make sure we're doing everything we can to, pr to protect the privacy of those communities. Thank you for that. Uh, the Innovation Fund. With each subsequent generation of wireless technology, we've experienced significant increases in network speeds and a number of connected services. As a co-chair of the 5G and Beyond Caucus, I've continued with my colleague and co-chair, Mr. Wahlberg, to push for innovative technologies and highlighted the importance of enhancing security of these networks as we increase the number of connections. How does a limited market of suppliers for wireless radio equipment impact the overall security of our networks? 
That it's a terrific question. Uh, the um, a, a limited set of suppliers makes our networks less secure because we have to rely on fewer of them. Uh, many countries around the world are relying on uh, untrusted suppliers, particularly from our competitors like in China. Um, and um, uh, uh, it, 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 it hinders innovation. So we're very eager to open up, the, to use our innovation fund to catalyze a more open market, uh, to create different layers where smaller companies and new innovators can get involved. That will make the supply chain ultimately more resilient. We'll have more suppliers involved. It'll create better competition, greater security. Let me build on that. Does our country's over-reliance on foreign vendors for 5G and successor wireless radio technology present a risk to our national security, data security, and resiliency of our wireless supply chain for future shocks? It does. So what do we do? Uh, well, we are, <laughs> Congress has uh, given us a, uh, um, uh, in the CHIPS Act, uh, the opportunity to really act here. We have a $1.5 billion wireless innovation fund. We are working, as I say, to catalyze and create more open markets to support Open RAN, which is an important, a uh, set of tools that I think will break open this market, uh, allow more competitors to engage, we'll get greater innovation, we'll be able to not just have to rely on foreign suppliers. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna cut to more chases. Uh, my colleagues have talked about the BEAD program. Will you, do you expect to meet the June 30th deadline? We do, we do. Okay. We think it's very important. National spectrum. Secretary Mondo has spoken often about the importance of spectrum to our economy and the need for a national spectrum strategy. You've launched your national spectrum strategy process and have received comments from numerous stakeholders. Can you provide us with a quick update on the spectrum strategy process? And once released, what are your plans for the implementation? And it matters to me in the heartland because Spectrum matters for a lot of our businesses. Spectrum matters for a huge amount of our businesses. It matters for the auto industry. A Correct. Amount, relying on it more and more. It's showing up in people's lives and people's cars, and that's terrific. We need to have a strategy that meets all of those needs, and that's what we're working on. We put out a request for comment. We got our comments back in. We're hard at work now on identifying the bands, 1,500 megahertz of spectrum that we want to make uh, available for study uh, so that we can, we can work on meeting that pipeline of need, and then uh, we expect to have a study out, I mean, have our strategy out by the end of the year. Thank you. I yield back, Thank Mr. You. Chair. The gentlelady yields. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas for five minutes, Representative Weber. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Davidson, thank you for being here. I'm over on this end. Mr. Davidson, over here. There we go. It's, it's the last time you'll see me to your left, just so you know. Um, one of the things I do want to do, I have the Gulf Coast of Texas. We have some rural uh, areas there on the Gulf Coast over in East Texas, Piney Woods section. As my grandfather used to say, that it was, it was so rural that it took three acres just to rust one nail. Now, that's real rural, okay? Um, I want to know a couple things. Uh, we have a lot of hurricanes, and so we deal with FEMA a lot, and we deal with a, a measurement called the low to moderate income when they're coming in with funding for disasters. So you've talked a lot about... Uh, doing this, the plans, the meet outs to these different states with the money. You talked about Florida. Texas also has a plan, I'm assuming. Are you up to speed? Do you know anything about it yet? Texas will have a plan, uh, it's, uh, and for both for digital equity and of course its, a, it's initial plan for the, for the uh, broadband, the big state grant program allocations. Uh, I think Texas, you know, has a huge challenge in terms of, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of households that need broadband connectivity, that need internet connectivity, and we're, we're eager to help. Right, uh, that's true in my district too. And, and I, I read in your comments, I think, where I, you, had a, you had a plan for, was it middle income, I think, but what about the LMI people, the low to moderate income that I described that FEMA uses? Do you all interact with any of those kinds of figures? Yeah, I actually, that's a great question about the FEMA tie-in. We have, um, the statute and our, our funding notice requires a low cost option. So when we deploy these networks, we give out this money, there has to be a low cost option for low, lower income Americans. We give states a fair amount of flexibility about how they're going to implement that and identify um, that, that low cost option. And the FEMA piece is something actually I haven't heard a lot about and I'll take it back to our team. We'd love to talk to you more about it. Okay, well, that's, uh, unfortunately for us, we, we yeah. deal with that too frequently on the yeah. Gulf Coast of Texas. 
Um, also, I, TxDOT came into my office a couple of years back, two or three years back, maybe maybe before pandemic even, when there was talk about a, a sell-off of some of the spectrum. And they wanted to reserve, they were against that because they thought they should reserve that area of spectrum for some of the car, the auto driving cars and the lights that communicate, signals that could communicate with vehicles. <coughs> Pardon me. And so is that what you're discussing today where, uh, where you're talking about a lot of the spectrum being used in communities on traffic things? I'm sorry, on which? On, on traffic signals, oh, on yeah. moving auto, uh, to autonomous vehicles. It, it is a little, it's part of what we're thinking about. I mean, there are a whole range of uses now of spectrum um, in, in the transportation sector. And there are technologies out there, and there's recent development to make sure that we've got uh, what they call CV2X, it's the connected vehicle um, uh, connections for safety purposes. That's something that's recently been, the FCC made a recent announcement about. But I just meant there's a more general principle here, which is all of these connected technologies are using spectrum more. We expect automotive uses to only increase. Everybody wants to be connected in their car. Everybody wants their cars to be able to do new things, manage traffic, uh, drive themselves, and all of that's going to rely on a steady pipeline. It, it might be a good thing if people are all connected in their car. If somebody gets mad, instead of doing something physical, they could they could maybe email them the hand gesture. I don't know. <laughs> um, just thinking about that. How do other countries manage some of their spectrum in respect to automobiles and traffic and highways? Do you know? Um, I only, uh, there are others who are more expert at NTIA about that. Um, but I know that uh, uh, we think about this quite a bit in terms of making sure we're harmonizing our work where we can in this importance of the World Radio Conference that's coming up, making sure that we're, uh, that what our industry needs in the future, our stakeholders need in the future, including our federal stakeholders, is reflected in those uh, international obligations. Do you all interact, <coughs> the loaded question, do you all interact with the Department of Defense about Spectrum? Um, we do, on a very regular basis. Can you interact harder? <laughs> um, I will say we've had a, actually, we've invested a lot and I have very, we have a very good working relationship right now uh, with our counterparts at the Department of Defense. I think they understand that our national security relies on our economic security. We do well as a nation when we have the leading wireless industry in the world and making sure that we've got the spectrum to feed that is going to be important. I agree with that, except I would reverse that our economic security relies on our national security. Thank you for that, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a five-minute recess right now. We will readjourn in five minutes. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started back. The chair is now going to recognize the lady from New Hampshire, Ms. Custer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome, Assistant Secretary Davidson. Thank you so much for being with us. As you know, NTIA is tasked with administering historic broadband programs to deliver high-speed, reliable, and affordable broadband internet services to everyone across the country. Closing the digital divide is no small task, and it will require the work and coordination of multiple federal agencies. That's why I am working with Representative Tim Wahlberg to reintroduce the proper leadership to align networks plan for broadband act, we call it. This bill will require the development of a national broadband strategy to assist federal agencies in aligning their efforts to deliver on the goal of connecting every community to the internet. A national strategy will maximize the impact of those broadband programs by directing federal funding to communities that are unserved or underserved and need it most. Mr. Davidson, I know your agency has already begun implementing these programs and has provided planning grants to states for the BEAD and Digital Equity Program. In New Hampshire, the State Broadband Office is already fast at work developing plans for both programs, and I appreciate your agency's ongoing attention to New Hampshire and support to get shovels in the ground and networks up and running. I know your staff is working closely with my office to help the state resolve uh, any issues and prevent program delays? Sorry. Uh, no worries. I, 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 first of all, thank you um, for your uh, for, for the for your comments, and it is incredibly important that we get these. This is a historic opportunity. We have to get these right once in a uh, generation moment for us to make sure that everybody in New Hampshire, everybody across the country is connected. I think you were asking about permitting, right? And, yeah. and I will say um, that is an area where we know that there are, there are big challenges. And uh, we know if we're going to, we feel the urgency of the moment, we, would, we know that people are really hungering to get connected. Uh, we, would, we want to make sure that once states give this money out, that the projects can move forward quickly. And we know that permitting can be a real challenge in some places. So this is an area where we've heard a lot from uh, stakeholders about it. We're trying to do what we can on the federal level to make sure we're streamlining all the federal processes. We're working closely with other federal agencies, trying to figure out how we can invest with states in making sure we're streamlining state and local processes too. Great, very helpful. Thank you so much and we'll continue to yes. work with your office. I'm the co-chair of the Bipartisan Rural Broadband Caucus, and I share your mission to bring internet access to every community, and especially, as Mr. Curtis has said, to rural communities that have previously been left behind. The BEAD program will invest $42 billion in our nation's broadband infrastructure to finally connect the hardest to reach communities. It's critical that this historic funding opportunity be optimized to provide high-speed, reliable internet to as many households as possible. Now, in the Granite State, as in Utah, New Hampshire has a lot of mountainous and difficult to penetrate terrain, which will make it challenging to deploy fiber to many homes in my district. However, there are several technologies like wireless, cable, and satellite that can be more easily deployed and provide comparable services in areas that fiber can't reach. Does the BEAD program provide sufficient flexibility to allow states to choose the broadband technology that most, may be most practical for each community? We, we believe it does. Um, and as you, as you rightly noted, every state is different, and we believe it's got to be an all-of-the-above approach if we're going to meet this goal of connecting everybody, particularly in rural America. And so we're, we fully expect that states uh, will have the flexibility to include a variety of technologies in their deployments. A lot will choose to f favor fiber uh, or have a lot of fiber. We hope there will be a lot of it out there because it's terrific, but in many places, there will also be fixed wireless, there will also be satellite deployments. Uh, those are going to be very good too, and we're excited about making sure that we've got the right mix. It will vary from state to state that connect everyone. Terrific. Thank you so much. Um, one quick last question. Another potential barrier is um, workforce. We have an unemployment rate of 2.1%. Um, does the BEAD and Digital Equity Program provide support for training for workforce? 
We do allow, uh, so first of all, let me just say that training, workforce and training issues are going to be huge. You rightly note already that unemployment rates can be, are very low in some of these areas. Uh, we're expecting that we're gonna need somewhere around 100,000 to 150,000 new jobs, 100,000 jobs that we'll, we'll have a shortfall on, and we are encouraging states to invest now in workforce training to make sure that we have the workforce we need when the money really hits and the shovels hit the ground. Terrific. Thank you so much, and I yield Thank back. You. The general lady yields. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Allen, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witness today. Uh, Mr. Davidson, the NTIA is leading a national spe spectrum strategy which requests feedback on broader spectrum management questions. In addition to specific frequency bands of interest, uh, while I understand there is interest in exploring the utility of dynamic spectrum sharing modeling, how will these uh, comments inform MTIA's effort to prioritize clearing exclusive use spectrum versus sharing? Well, I'll just say that we're, we expect that there's going to need to be a uh, kind of all, uh, another all of the above approach if we're going to meet our future spectrum needs. There'll be a need, there are needs for unlicensed spectrum, for shared spectrum, and also for excuse, exclusive licensed spectrum. And uh, uh, we're working on all of those and our national spectrum strategy is designed to put together a strategy for meeting all of those needs uh, and particularly identifying 1500 megahertz of, of spectrum to study uh, to make sure we're meeting those needs in the years to come. Uh, two of the bills we're reviewing today enshrine important cybersecurity roles in NTIA. It is my understanding that NTIA has been increasingly active on cybersecurity matters. As NTIA continues to take on more cyber uh, security policy development initiatives, initiatives, how important is it that the NTIA is informed by information security professionals in the private sector? Well, I think it's incredibly important that we're, we're informed well about the work that we're doing. We know that a lot of great expertise exists um, in the private sector, and we regularly speak with folks there. We have a big mission there. I mean, the administration has made this a priority. There are a lot of other parts of the administration where this work is done. NTIA, uh, has a, has, a, has a big role in sort of making sure that our broadband networks are secure, looking at our supply chain, um, and uh, recently even taking on issues like the, uh, the security of the internet router system, our border gateway protocol, BGP, and making sure that um, even in areas like that, uh, we're, we're, a le we're, le we're a leading voice of expertise. And in this effort, what do you think NTIA can add value for the American taxpayer? Well, um, you know, again, we, I'll recognize there are a lot of other, there are other agencies that are uh, taking the lead in this space. We believe we have a, a particular role to play as uh, experts on thinking about the economic impact of cybersecurity policy, thinking about uh, how it affects our other digital economy and telecommunications policies, our expertise and our work in standards internationally. Each of those areas touches on uh, this work on cybersecurity, and we want to make sure we're doing our part. Again, there'll be others who take the lead, but we have a role to play, and we're going to make sure we do it well. Uh, moving on, uh, will NTIA recommend to OMB that the Buy American standards for optical fiber need to allow for more than one manufacturer to comply? Um, we are looking very closely at making sure that we can meet the needs of um, uh, our broadband deployments. At the same time, we want to make sure that we're using this as, a, if we're spending federal money here, we want to spend it to promote American manufacturing and American jobs where we can. So uh, we're going to take a close look. We're working very closely with the fiber cable suppliers to make sure there's adequate supply. I was gratified to see that just recently an announcement in uh, North Carolina. I was down there with the secretary. Uh, new, new assembly lines, uh, manufacturing lines for fiber cable being put together specifically to meet the need uh, that's being generated by these programs. So that's exactly what we're looking for. Uh, there's already been discussion today on rural cell service. Over the past several years, Georgia's 12th district has seen major improvements in uh, home broadband connectivity. However, consistent cell service remains to be a big problem in the district. I've heard from plenty of my constituents before that they don't want to hear what the federal government's going to do to improve broadband access as long as they still do not have consistent cell service. <laughs> What policies or, or incentives does uh, NTIA recommend to encourage private companies to invest to sell infrastructure in rural areas? 
Uh, well, you know, you know, the biggest thing is, of course, making sure that we've got that pipeline of spectrum available to them to do those deployments. And uh, I think that's that's probably the biggest area where we're working hard to make sure that we're supporting the work that's being the good work that's being also done by the the Federal Communications Commission and that, others. Yeah, that's kind of my next question: is how how are you collaborating with the uh, FCC uh, to facilitate and expedite the deployment of cell towers? You know, which again, you know, right. trying to get permits and things like that so we can uh, c connect the, the district. Yeah. Well, again, I mean, uh, the FCC has been a lead, a, a real thought leader, a leader on this, not just thought leader, a real leader on making sure this, these deployments are happening. We're working closely with them on a range of issues. And I will also say our, our hope is that our broadband deployments, putting more connectivity, more backhaul out into the field will ultimately help uh, also with some of these deployments. So we're okay. eager to continue to collaborate on that. And thank you for your All right, support. thank you. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Kelly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank Chair Latta and Ranking Member Matsui for holding this morning's hearing. I also want to thank Assistant Secretary Davison for being here today and all the work NTIA is conducting to expand access to affordable high-speed internet services. I, like many of you, don't think any community should be left out of the digital revolution. Equitable access to internet and broadband services is especially important for the rural parts of my district and many others. And that's why I, along with my constituents and other Illinoisans, are eager to see the BEAD program materialize into projects in our communities. But I know you and the agency still have work ahead of you, particularly looking ahead to June 30th and the announcements of allocations. My understanding of the challenge process is that the NTIA will use the Federal Communications Commission's national broadband map to determine based on need which, states need, which states need additional money, and then states will have their own challenge process on FCC maps to drill down even further where the needs are for each individual state. So Assistant Secretary Davidson, now that NTIA has received public comment on this challenge process, when will NTIA finalize its model challenge process for the B program? And once out allotments are announced, how does NTIA plan to work with states to incorporate third-party data to provide a better picture of internet availability? Well, uh, uh, Congresswoman, first of all, thank, thank you for those questions. Thank you for your support um, uh, of these programs. And we do feel the weight of this historic opportunity here to connect everybody and make sure that no one is left behind. The state challenge process that you mentioned is actually quite important here because it's a way to make sure that the states are putting together um, their version of, that their programs are not, uh, uh, are spending the money where they should be spending it. And that we've really uncovered where the unserved truly are. And we know those unserved communities, they, they exist, those unserved locations. We have broadband deserts in urban areas and suburban areas and we want, and the state challenge processes are gonna be really important making sure we uncover all of those and, and we're really spending the money where the need is. Um, uh, we've released actually uh, proposed guidance uh, uh, on the challenge processes. Uh, we are uh, also providing what I think of as a kind of plug and play model for states so that uh, we're offering sort of uh, kind of model guidance. Here's a, here's, a here's a challenge process that you can just pick up and use that we think will meet uh, uh, you know, meet the requirements of the statute, and states can use that, but we also expect some states are gonna kind of uh, go with their own, and we're prepared to look at that too. So more to come, our guidance is out. We're gonna be putting more guidance out for states, and, it'll be, and we'll be eager to see uh, how, they, how they choose to implement. Well, I'm encouraged that this program and other programs uh, will make meaningful progress in, br in bridging the digital divide but once uh, everything's in place, infrastructure's built, the program still needs to be nurtured. We have to be really intentional about making sure that we close uh, that internet or the digital divide among um, communities, and especially as so much stuff is online. Well, I'll just say we wholeheartedly agree. We look at this as this is a years long effort, right? And deployment is only a piece of it. It's why those digital equity programs are so important as well. We want to make sure that people have the connection that goes to their home, but we also need to make sure it's affordable, and we need to make sure that they have the tools they need to get on, to stay Thank online you. and thrive. How do we ensure in the months and years to come that we are not creating a new digital divide within those communities that have been historically left behind? Well, we, this is going to be an area where we need to 
be in constant communication and, um, and do con continual data collection to make sure we're seeing where people are online. And, and again, not just where there's a connection, but where people are actually getting service, using that service. Um, and that's kind of the, some of the data that we're expecting to collect when we look at measuring the outcomes of all this work. And again, we're looking at this as a, this is a decade long project uh, for some of the funding programs that's, that's the time horizon that we're looking at. And again, it's not just about deployment. It's all about making sure that people are actually thriving online. Thank you, and I'll yield back. Thank, Thank you for you. your responses. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Balderson, for five minutes. Ohio. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that would be Ohio. That we, would be Ohio. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, <laughs> same thing. <laughs> same thing. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Assistant Secretary, for being here today. Uh, <clears throat> with the bead money, and we've talked about this today a little bit, with the bead money going to states soon, I'm concerned about the application providers need to submit and permits they need to acquire to build out networks. The full committee will mark up a package of broadband permitting bills tomorrow, but I want to discuss what your agency is currently doing to address the burdensome permitting process. Again, we touched on that a little bit. Long permitting or environmental reviews can significantly delay the deployment of networks. Can you tell me what NTIA is doing to streamline deployment approvals to ensure bead funding is being used to rapidly deploy, deploy networks to underserved and unserved households and businesses? Well, it's, it's a terrific question, sir, because <coughs> we're keenly interested and concerned about potential delays in deployment. We, know, we feel the urgency of the moment. We know that people really want these networks. We're working hard to get money out to the states and ultimately to providers. We would hate it to be a situation where providers get their money and then uh, they're not able to build their networks for years because of uh, these, kinds of these kinds of hurdles. Um, we're working uh, very closely now to, to, to develop a permitting uh, a pr a strategy. Uh, we're working closely with other federal agencies to streamline the federal permitting process, and I, that is starting to bear real fruit. That's the area where we have the greatest control, uh, and making sure we're working with the big land management agencies and others who have uh, who can help us there. The other big challenge is going to be the state and local level. Agree. Thank you. Uh, I think everyone in this room agrees that we want to close the digital divide and connect all Americans. As you know, many households in rural Ohio and my district remain completely underserved. Do you think that bead program funds should be prioritized for households that are completely unserved before using funds to upgrade speeds for existing networks? Yeah, I think the um, statute that we're implementing is very clear. We're given an ambitious mission, connect everybody in the country. Um, we're only going to meet that mission if we're making sure we spend our money wisely where it's most needed. The statute's very clear in our minds. Unserved first, and that's where we're going to spend the money. All right, thank you. My last question is I, I want to shift topics to the supply chain. Uh, with such a massive increase of federal dollars going toward broadband, providers will be competing for the same materials as they build out networks at the same time. What is your agency doing to ensure that the supply chain for network equipment is strong and that there won't be delays caused by a sudden increase in demand for network equipment? Uh, well, I'll just say, uh, and you think about it in the context of the broadband programs, correct, sir? Um, so it's a, it's a really important question, Congressman, because we are uh, also wanting to make sure that uh, there aren't, there aren't un, un, unfortunate delays or increases in prices because we don't have the supply chain that we need. So this is an area where we're investing quite a bit of energy because we see this as not just a connectivity program, but it's also an American jobs and manufacturing program. And where we can, we really want to work with and incentivize the, provide, the builders of those network equipment, the builders of, uh, of fiber optic cable to make sure that they're manufacturing that equipment in the U.S. and, they're invest and that they know there's this big opportunity coming um, from this funding. So we're really pushing uh, and we're working with uh, providers to make sure we're getting more American jobs, more, more manufacturing here in the U.S. Uh, we'll note that there will probably be, there'll be, there'll be challenges to do, doing that. There are areas, there's kinds of equipment that are, are going to be very hard to source here in the U.S. And as we have in other programs, we'll be looking at, the, at waivers, but the bar for those waivers need to be high. We want to make sure we're doing everything we can to get the equipment sourced locally. Then we'll make sure that, uh, that the, but we want to make sure these programs succeed. And so we're working to really take a close eye 
uh, piece by piece at what's needed in the supply chain. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Mr. You. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman from Ohio yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Fleischer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to Chairman Latta and Ranking Member Matsui for convening today's hearing to discuss the central role the NTIA plays in spectrum management, broadband deployment, and other federal telecommunications and technology policy. We've covered these topics pretty extensively today. Um, Assistant Secretary Davidson, I thank you for joining us and discussing these topics, sharing your insights with us, um, with our entire subcommittee. Um, as you mentioned in your opening statement, one of NTIA's many important responsibilities is management of public safety communications, including next generation 911 and overseeing the first responder network authority or FirstNet. Um, this is a topic we haven't really touched on yet in this hearing, so I'm glad to, um, to have a chance to ask you about it and also to see the first responders who've joined us today for this hearing. Uh, I appreciated getting the chance to visit with them. Um, since January of 2018, all 50 states and six territories have opted into FirstNet and use it to coordinate state and local law enforcement and first responder efforts. In my district, Texas' 7th Congressional District in the Houston area, not far from Mr. Weber's, um, we have seen this network has been absolutely essential in supporting uh, crisis response from natural disasters to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I just visited with, with Chief Schaefer about his how vital this connectivity has been to his community in Washington State. Um, so last week, I reintroduced the FirstNet Reauthorization Act to ensure network continuity and to support our first responders. Uh, and I'm so glad that the committee has brought that before us for consideration so quickly. Um, so I wanna focus my questions to you on this issue. First, Mr. Davidson, can you just talk about how FirstNet serves as a, an example of a public-private partnership? Well, I have to say thank, thank you for this question, and I, I'm, I'm glad we're getting a chance to talk about it, because FirstNet has been in, in many ways an amazing success story in terms of an example of a very highly successful public-private partnership. Uh, I served in the Commerce Department uh, previously, and when I left in, uh, well, when I was serving in 2015, 2016, FirstNet was just a PowerPoint presentation. It was an idea. To come back now and see a network that is supporting over 4.7 million first responders around the country, over 25,000 uh, uh, public service, uh, public safety agencies, fire departments, like we've seen here today, uh, police departments, uh, EMTs who are relying on the first net network to make sure that they have connectivity on a bad day in case of emergency. And, uh, and the networks were working incredibly well. So it's really uh, an example of a success story of how uh, we can build a public-private partnership to serve a real, uh, a real need for our, for our first responders. Well, thank you, and I think that leads into my follow-up question very nicely, which is can you tell us why it's so important to reauthorize FirstNet before its sunset in 2027? Right. Well, it's incredibly important because, it, the, because the project does sunset in 2027 without reauthorization. We need that reauthorization. We now have millions of first responders who are relying uh, on the network. It's been highly successful. And uh, we, we've, you know, there are stories every, every month, every year, uh, uh, all the time about uh, uh, how FirstNet has been able to help in the cases of day-to-day uh, -day emergencies, in the cases of public, uh, you know, major disasters. And um, I just know that we, we need to reauthorize it uh, to make sure it's on firm footing, and we should do it well in advance of the actual deadline so that we can continue to operate with confidence uh, and with our, our private sector partner to make sure we're continuing to invest in the network and build it out for the first responders who need it. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, I look forward to working with my colleagues on the subcommittee and on our committee to reauthorize this important program. And I have about a minute left, so with the time I have left, I do want to touch on one other topic, one that we've discussed um, pretty extensively today, and several of my colleagues just asked you kind of related questions. Uh, Ms. Custer, Mr. Allen, and Mr. Balderson all asked about permitting relating to uh, NTI implementation of bead funds. And um, I have introduced uh, both in the last Congress and again in this Congress, the Broadband Incentives for Communities Act, which provide grants for local governments to hire and train employees, to buy software, to do things to expand their permitting capabilities. And this is something that we know from experience in my district in Houston, where we have some of the largest um, 
operators and folks who are, who are working on building out this infrastructure, they have seen that this is absolutely essential to effective broadband deployment. Uh, it is not in tomorrow's markup, but I hope that this committee will move it quickly. And because I'm going to run out of time, I might ask Mr. Davidson if I could ask uh, to get your response in the record about how a grant program like this at the local level could help prevent bottlenecks and delays uh, and support rapid infrastructure de deployment in all communities. So I know I'm out of time and I will yield back, but I will submit that question. Thank you so much for your time today. Happy to do it, and it's a great, great idea. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Fulcher, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Davidson, thank you for being here. It's good to talk with you. Uh, Mr. Davidson, NTIA represents the U.S. on issues regarding the domain name service through the Government Advisory Committee within ICANN. And uh, uh, ICANN's multi-stakeholder model is an attempt to, ac to access and manage management of websites uh, that they will remain open and have a transparent process. At least that's the, uh, that's the attempt. Can you elaborate on NTIA's role within that advisory committee? Absolutely. So um, first of all, the <coughs> uh, domain name system and the issues around it are uh, in, in, in some ways in the background, most Americans probably aren't really thinking about how the domain name system works, but it's actually an incredibly important area to make sure it's functioning properly. And we've had this multi-stakeholder approach, not run by governments, but actually run by a, the community of technical experts. It's been very successful so far. There is a government advisory committee, and NTIA serves as the federal lead, or the U.S. lead on that advisory committee, making sure that we're the interface so that we work at I can to solve uh, big issues. So with that, can you share with us what steps that NTIA has been taking to ensure internet domains aren't abused or uh, supporting cybersecurity cyber security attacks, uh, making sure they're not devastating right. and impacting us in a negative fashion? Uh, it, it's an area, of, all of those are areas of real constant attention. We have staff who are uh, part of the uh, ICANN working groups on, those, on some of those issues. Um, we are particularly interested in making sure, for example, that uh, we have the continued uh, operation of the, the WHOIS database to make sure that um, uh, legitimate law enforcement and other uh, uh, folks who need access to that information are able to get it. Uh, we're keenly interested in the security of um, the domain name system, making sure that we're supporting it in any ways we can from the uh, federal government side. So uh, those are all top the topics you mentioned are all topics that we are watching and uh, engaged on, uh, think are quite important. So one of the things I wanted to, to just get your feeling on was where you think NTIA's position, uh, position is within this effort. And if you think you've got the, the strength position there, uh, to set that up, uh, Congress has recently taken steps to elevate NTIA's cybersecurity policy expertise as cybersecurity risks present more challenges for American businesses and consumers. Specifically, in 2019, uh, directed NTIA to carry out a supply chain vulnerability information sharing program uh, known as the C-Script program. And so, from our vantage point, one of NTIA's strengths as an agency is, is its policy development and multi-stakeholder approach, which you just talked about to convening other agencies. Um, one of the examples is NTIA works with other federal agencies on spectrum matters and under the Access Broadband Act, NTIA also works closely with federal agencies to coordinate broadband deployment and permitting challenges. So from your vantage point, do you think NTIA is in a strong position of leverage there when it comes to uh, interagency uh, cybersecurity challenge? Uh, I'm very it's proud of our work in this space, and thank you for, for asking about it. Uh, we do feel there are, uh, we, you know, as I, I, I said in a, answer to a previous question, there are a lot of agencies that are working on cybersecurity within the federal government on an operational level. Um, and uh, we work, we're trying to do our part on this, and our focus is really about cybersecurity policy. And where I think we've had real expertise to bring to the table has been in understanding the policy demand dimensions of some of our cybersecurity issues, really understanding um, uh, the impact on the economy and on businesses of some of the uh, cybersecurity uh, policies that we're putting in place. We're also doing a lot of operational work ourselves, thinking about, for example, our broadband deployment 
and making sure we've got good cybersecurity standards for all the federal money that's going out. We think about it in the context of Spectrum, as you mentioned. We're working on the C-Script program to make sure that we've got good supply chain information about cybersecurity risks going out to small, uh, smaller companies. So across the board, working on our vulnerable equ uh, vulnerability equities process. So across the board, we've got areas. We've got, you know, we don't, we're not the biggest operational agency out there, but on cybersecurity policy, we've got a real role to play, and we're very proud of the work we're doing there. Thank you for that. And I am about out of time, but I am going to submit a question in writing to you. It has to do with GDPR Great. and uh, their uh, privacy versus the, yeah. the Who Is directory, but I'll get that to you in writing. Very important Mr. question. Chairman? Glad to answer it. Mr. Chairman, you yield back. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes the lady from Minnesota, Ms. Craig, for five minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Ranking Member Matsui, for holding today's hearing. Uh, and thank you, Assistant Secretary Davidson, for being here today, and of course, for the work that you do to make sure that Americans have reliable access to the internet. Our communities and constituents rely on affordable, accessible broadband for their health care, to support their businesses, and for their children to uh, do their schoolwork these days. The need for reliable broadband access in rural areas is significant, and there are still too many communities, uh, even in Minnesota's second district, that lack this essential infrastructure. I believe that the work NTIA is doing is critical to helping us close the digital divide, so thank you so much for that. Um, we've heard from you today repeatedly that NTIA expects states to honor enforceable commitments to deploy broadband and treat those areas as served for purposes of BEAD. Given that federal and state agencies are currently making awards for infrastructure under different programs, I want to make sure we avoid duplication of funding so that those dollars reach as many communities as possible. So a couple of questions for you. Uh, how is NTIA working with other agencies to distribute those funding awards for various projects in a way that ensures consistency and equity across states and townships? Well, I really appreciate that question. And um, uh, we've been given a huge mission. The president has directed us, we have to uh, make sure that everyone in America has access to high-speed, affordable, reliable internet service. And he keeps saying everyone, which makes us a little nervous, but um, uh, to do that, we know we have to be smart about it, and that means avoiding a duplication where federal funding's already happening. Uh, so we're working very closely uh, with other, our, our other agencies. We coordinate with them on a very regular basis. Our staffs are in constant communication. We've put in place new MOUs so that we can exchange data with some of those other agencies. And there's uh, um, uh, just a, a huge amount of coordination from the White House on down to make sure that we are uh, marching in lockstep and we're not duplicating efforts. I appreciate that very much. Let me just follow up with uh, what specific actions are you taking to make sure that underserved communities, which in Minnesota are often our rural communities, are prioritize when it comes to building both affordable and accessible broadband infrastructure. And you just said in your remarks, um, everyone, uh, that's a tall order, uh, given the geography of certain uh, congressional districts across this country, even in uh, my own, it's very difficult. So uh, give me a sense of what you're doing to close that gap in rural communities. Sure. Uh, well, I think it's very important that, you know, starting point, again, our, our, we've, we're taking the mission to heart which is really to connect everybody. And the statute, uh, the, broad, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, is very clear that we, the priority is to serve unserved communities first. So truly those communities, that, uh, those locations, those, those households that don't have that basic 25 megabit per second you know, uh, service. And um, that's, we're gonna make sure that states that's their state, that's a state focus. We're, we're being faithful to the statute. And that is how we're really going to make sure we're getting to these rural communities by saying we've got to prioritize the unserved. Every state has, including the state of Minnesota, has to give us a plan for how they're going to reach everybody in their state with the funding that they've been given. And we expect it to include a, a variety of technologies to, to be able to do that. Thank you. Um, again, thank you so much for testifying here to yeah. us today. And so generous uh, with your time. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll yield back uh, some life to my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs>
The general lady yields. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Pfluger, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Assistant Secretary. Thank you for being here. Um, you've touched on a lot of the things that I wanted to touch on, but I, I'll get specific. Um, I, I represent a rural district. Um, it's home to the most prolific energy producing area in the country, in fact, probably in the world, uh, and also um, produces a tremendous amount of agriculture. And when, when I look at the, the amount of money that has gone into um, these efforts, um, it, it might be an oversight, um, and, and please help me understand if it is. When I, when I read your testimony, I don't see the word rural anywhere in your testimony. Um, and that really is concerning. Uh, because I think you've heard on a bipartisan level, in fact, from my colleague from Minnesota, talking about underserved areas being rural. Um, your priorities, you know, mentioned tribal lands, they go into uh, the middle mile, and then they talk about, uh, you know, some of the minority serving institutions, of which my district uh, has multiple uh, either minority serving institutions or Hispanic serving institutions, including Angeles State University, which is a cyber center of excellence. So. Um, looking at the technology neutral statements that you have made and, and the, um, you know, the agency has talked about, I am concerned that fiber is being prioritized ahead of other areas. So can you please clarify, it, both in your testimony about the rural needs and when it comes to technology neutral, whether that means only fiber or is there going to be a mixture of the best of the above uh, to serve these areas? Well, uh, as a starting point, you know, we've been given this mission to connect everyone in the country with high-speed, reliable, affordable internet service, and we really mean everyone. So that includes, and we know, and in fact, in some ways, perhaps it goes without saying more than it should, uh, we know that includes, and primarily will be, rural areas where there's a huge number of unserved locations. So um, it's top of mind for us how to reach these rural communities. You heard, and I uh, stand by what I also said uh, to the Congresswoman from Minnesota. Um, we, uh, we are gonna make sure that we are reaching the unserved first. We've required every state to submit a plan to us before they get their money that shows how they are going to reach all of the unserved in their states. And for many of them, the real challenges are going to be in the rural areas. Yeah. And it's going to require, as you know, a variety of technologies. And uh, as, uh, um, as I just said um, uh, to Congresswoman Craig, you know, we expect, particularly in rural areas, that the, that the way to meet the need will be with that variety, uh, kind of an all of the above approach. So it's gonna technology. be licensed and unlicensed. It'll be fiber and satellite. And, and this is what I can go home and tell my constituents that, that this plan Absolutely. is coming and that they're Absolutely. gonna have access. And we do, we are going to try and push fiber out as, as far as we can because that is the, you know, I think that is, we wanna make sure we're giving every American the best internet service that we can. You still need to have backhaul even if you've got fixed wireless services being deployed. Yep. But the truth is that in these really hard to reach locations, I, I'm sure you're, incredibly familiar with them. Um, there are gonna be places where we're, go we're gonna rely on satellite, we're gonna rely on fixed wireless for sure. I think it's really important because you're talking about precision agriculture impacts here, Absolutely. you're talking about the oil and gas industry, the, the renewable industry, I mean, all these things come together. I would invite you to come to Glasscock County uh, and see the amount of production that happens when it comes to agriculture and energy, yeah. a mixture of energy. Yeah. And fiber may not be the yeah. best option there. Um, so uh, maybe it was an oversight in your testimony that rural was not mentioned, but but duly this, noted, sir. Duly this needs noted. to be part of the the public yeah. facing campaign. Uh, let me let me switch uh, areas real quick. Um, who needs to be in the room when it comes to spectrum discussions? Uh, Twenty year fighter pilot. I've used the six to eight megahertz um, range uh, my entire career. So who needs to be in the room to have these discussions? To have the auctions available? but also to preserve our national security. And, and what would you recommend to this committee? Well, um, I, you know, our, our belief, first of all, we're only going, we, we need to have that um, pipeline of spectrum as I've spoken, but we only are gonna do that if we can also make sure we're meeting federal, important federal uh, uh, user needs, including national security needs, uh, aviation safety, all of that has to also be accounted for. So that's why these coordination mechanisms are incredibly important. And I know it can sometimes sound a little boring, but that's actually the hard work that we need to do. We convene, that's what NTI does. We convene the federal stakeholders. We create that room. 
they need to have a seat at the table too when we're making these decisions. And um, we need to make sure we've got all the stakeholders coordinated or else we're not gonna succeed in these efforts. So thank you for raising it. Thank you, my time has expired. I invite you to come to my district, to come to Angelo State University to see the Cyber Center of Excellence, which is a Hispanic serving institution directly in line with your priorities and to see the good work that's being done with that. I yield back. Thank you, sir. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the general lady from Tennessee, Ms. Harshbarger, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Assistant Secretary, for being here today. Um, you know, per permitting reform is one of the committee's uh, top priorities, and I serve, as Mr. Fluger said, a, a rural district in East Tennessee. I have two distressed counties. I have the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, so there's a lot of... Uh, yeah. You know, a lot of mountainous terrain, too. Um, I appreciate that um, NTIA directs states to identify steps to reduce cost and barriers to deployment and encourages state and local governments to expedite permitting timelines and waiving fees where applicable. However, what steps are you taking to ensure that states and local governments actually follow through and uh, really respond in a timely manner, like and also cap fees and other lives, otherwise streamline permitting processes? Well, it's, it's uh, first of all, thank you for the question because we feel the great urgency mm -hmm. uh, that people have to get connected. And we know um, that uh, there are real challenges out there and we would, uh, we're working so hard to get this money out to the states and then ultimately out to the providers who are gonna build these networks. We want them mm -hmm. to be able to build, right? Yeah. Uh, and to build as quickly as possible. Uh, the issues are gonna be that that, of course, always has to take into account the, 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 perm, the local and state needs, uh, the permitting needs. And um, what we're really doing is two things. One is we're doing, the place where we have the greatest control is at the federal level, and of course, we're investing a lot in working with the federal agencies on that. You're asking about the state and local level, yeah. and uh, we are really going to push the states. So we haven't gotten these initial plans yet. It's still early days. We have said, the homework assignment is show us Show us what you're gonna to do to invest in these permitting processes. In many places, a lot of it's about resources, right? So you oh, just have one person who's the permitting chief in a county or a town. Yeah, very have, limited. And, and there's a tidal wave coming. Yeah. And we want, this, so that's really what we want state, to work with states and localities on. Know this tidal wave is coming. Invest in the resources to be able to handle it. Is there a time, uh, I guess a uh, time frame that you have for these states to get that that report in? We're, we're trying to share with the states our sense of what the, mm -hmm. you know, kind of deployment wave looks like. Um, and it's, uh, so we've shared a lot of that information at the state level. Um, uh, I think the investment at, you know, especially at the state and local level in these processes is, is, is it gonna be a huge piece of it? And it's, again, yeah. it's really trying to sound a little of the alarm for folks, so well, appreciate your attention to it's, it. It's, yeah. The time frame, that's the whole thing. You know, we have, and I have one other question that goes along with that. Will the state, do they have the authority to choose somebody to put that fiber in, or do they have to go through um, federal agency to do that? You mean about who the, yeah. who the providers mm -hmm. will be? The states will be, under our program, a huge amount of this happens at the state level. Yeah. So the big $42 billion grant program that we're implementing, states will be doing, making decisions about who the, who the providers who are. Who provider will be. And so they will be the ones who are in the best position to figure out how to make sure, to see those timelines, understand how to make sure they're moving quickly. We're trying to help them, yeah. work with them as much as we can. There's possibly things that Congress could do here too. Yeah. Um, but I would just note that um, getting this balance right is important and capacity for the state and local level permitting offices is a, is a huge possible well, you know, potential I mean, win there. They need to know there is a, a time right. frame. Um, NTIA is, has also worked with federal agencies to help streamline their approval processes to review broadband permitting requests for federal land. What are some of the barriers uh, that still remain and what are you doing to remove those? Well, I think one of the things we've seen has been really about capacity and I'm gratified to mm -hmm. see that th these conversations are bearing fruit. Again, it's still early days here. From, you know, We're looking at a wave that's gonna come in probably 2025 when you really talk about shovels hitting the ground and a lot of money being spent. But the, um, uh, we've started this early work of working with the big land management agencies, folks who administer this, to make sure, again, that they understand these timelines, yeah. that they know, and it's starting, it is also already starting on some of our programs, and so that they're putting the resources in and will have the expertise in place 
to have people on the ground who can do rapid review of these of these applications. Okay. Thanks so much. I think. Thanks. I have 25 seconds. I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the general lady from Georgia, Ms. Kamick. <laughs> Hello, sir. I am the general lady from Florida, the great Florida Gators. And as you can tell, the chairman is a little bit salty that we just have better colors than he does. Can you briefly describe the duties in, uh, of the Office of Public Safety Communications, what are the priorities, and how can Congress support uh, NTIA's roles in advancing public safety communication technologies? Uh, well, thank you for that question. And uh, we had a group of first responders I, here earlier. I saw that. Um, it was terrific to see them here. And it just underscores the importance of this work, and it's a really uh, essential area. We do two major things that I would highlight through our Office of Public Safety Communications. One of them is um, working with FirstNet, uh, and mm -hmm. we're the oversight group in, body within the federal government for FirstNet. Uh, that's been an incredibly successful public-private partnership. Uh, we've got now over 4.7 million first responders using that network. I'm very proud of our work uh, uh, with FirstNet on that. The second big area is around next generation 911 services and really investing in making sure that our, uh, as I'd say, our first first responders have the technology that they need to be really effective in supporting uh, Americans in case moments of emergency. I appreciate that. You know, my husband is a first responder. Uh, he is on FirstNet. And oh, uh, yes, so 16 years as a firefighter, SWAT yeah. medic, and, and we're very familiar with it. But I do think that NTIA has such a uh, an important role, and sometimes the, the public safety side of it isn't really discussed in this conversation. I was glad to hear my colleague mention the reauthorization efforts, but um, just wanted to make sure that we got that on the record. Yes. And I know it was touched on earlier, talking about AI, um, NTIA being one of the many agencies seeking input on responsible policy regarding AI. And um, I wanted to know with this public policy request for comment um, period that you guys are in, what are some of the biggest challenges that you're going to be seeing or that you foresee as it relates to communications networks and AI? Uh, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a terrific question. So I'll just say just generally, I mean, we are excited about responsible innovation in AI, right? It's going to bring tremendous benefits uh, to people if it's done properly. Um, at the same time, there are these real risks and concerns that uh, need to be addressed if we're going to have a successful successful deployments of AI. Our, um, we're part of a, a, a much a broad federal effort to address the issues that are being raised by new AI technologies. Um, and uh, uh, our part in particular is really focused on the policy side and what we can do to help make sure that AI systems are uh, uh, trustworthy, right? That they actually do what they say they're going to do. And it's a hard problem. And you think of it as almost like financial audits, right? Uh, uh, if you think about, you know, uh, uh, auditing a company's books, you. You do it after the fact to make sure that they actually, uh, you know, made the money they said they made, paid the taxes they said they were going to pay. Um, we want to make sure we can support the same kinds of systems for right. AI systems, and that's the idea behind our work. And I think it will be a big issue in communications networks generally because we're going to see AI deployed widely uh, to support communications and, you know, across the internet. And we want to make sure that it's being uh, again deployed in a trustworthy way. Well, and you had mentioned this. From a telecommunication standpoint, what is the number one concern or risk that you see with the implementation or introduction of AI into those systems? Yeah. I think probably safety concerns will ultimately be a, a, a pretty big deal in the long run. Uh, in the short term, we do worry about, um, we worry about bias, uh, which we're seeing already right now uh, against particular communities. Worry about privacy, too. Uh, what data is being collected, what data is being used, and how it's being used. So those will be, I think you already see those things as short-term issues. Long-term, um, 
again, I think safety, pro security, and also job displacement. Um, uh, you know, as, as we start to see more deployment, the question of whether, uh, you know, how that affects the jobs that Americans have and whether we're making sure that there are good transition paths for people. So how, as you're crafting an AI policy, getting input on that AI policy, how are you developing the internet policy in conjunction with the concerns of AI and work across the, I don't want to use the word spectrum since <laughs> it means something different to us, but across the spectrum with other agencies in this relevant space? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I know I'm almost out of time. I'll just say really quickly that um, we're closely coordinated with other agencies. This isn't just going to be an NTIA thing. Other parts of the Commerce Department are very involved in thinking about risk, our, our colleagues at NIST, but really across the federal government in different vertical areas. I think you'll see from defense to employment, different agencies really taking a hard look at these things. We're trying to take an overarching look at uh, trustworthiness, but mm -hmm. um, uh, we're working closely in the interagency process as well. And thank you for your interest in it. Happy to talk more about it anytime. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. My time has expired. Mr. Chairman, the gentleman from Florida yields back. The general lady yields. The gentleman from, chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thanks for uh, allowing me to wave on to this important hearing today on this committee that I served on, subcommittee that I served on for the better part of a decade or more. And so I, I appreciate it. These, in, these issues are still very much uh, important to me. Mr. Davidson, one of the key functions of NTIA under the NTIA Organization Act is to represent the views of the executive branch to the Federal Communications Commission. While we know NTIA does this on spectrum matters, my, tele, my Team Telecom Act would put NTIA in a similar position to act as a coordinator of certain national security reviews of telecommunications networks seeking to serve the United States. This discussion draft would still preserve the subject matter expertise of other relevant agencies. Can you please describe how, if enacted, NTIA would work with the relevant team telecom voting agencies to ensure this review process is conducted in a timely and transparent manner? Uh. I appreciate the question, and uh, as you can as you can imagine, I, uh, uh, as a computer scientist, you'll probably appreciate this: that uh, many of the issues that we face in those settings are, um, you know, they're complex technical issues. They really require a depth of expertise to understand um, understand the issues and understand their implications for for our economy, uh, for companies, and that has been the role that NTI has often played in these conversations. Has been to uh, be an expert voice uh, that we can offer as a counterpoint at times to some of our colleagues uh, in these conversations. So I just say, um, uh, you know, we try to coordinate and uh, make sure that we are raising those kinds of issues, really understanding the technology and its policy implications, uh, and we appreciate efforts to try and make sure we have a stronger voice at the table. Okay, all right. Well, you know, Chair Rogers noted that later this week, uh, the Americas region will be meeting to develop a regional position on several important spectrum matters at CTEL. You described NTIA's role in the domestic policy development process as representing the interest of the executive branch uh, agencies in this process to make sure the U.S. can continue to protect their mission critical operations. Given that, do you think the process for developing a domestic position ahead of these conferences is working? Well, I'll just, um, I, I think it is, and, and here's why, actually, uh, I may have emphasized at the, in a particular moment part of our role, which is that we are working as the federal manager. We, we are the coordinator of federal spectrum, and we work very closely with different agencies. But we also have a dual imperative here. We're dual-hatted, and we work and think as the president's advisor on spectrum policy, we, we spend an awful lot of time thinking about how we make sure we're meeting the needs of the private sector as well. So I'll say, first of all, we really, we, we, all of our conversation today about the spectrum pipeline, the need to have a leading industry, feeds into our positioning when we think about how we represent at CTEL and at the World Radio Conference. Um, 
And I will say we've, we've been lucky to have, we have great leadership right now in this space uh, working at the State Department. We have real expertise in our, at NTIA and other sister agencies who experienced negotiators who've been through a World Radio Conference before. We are out there fighting for America, for our competitiveness, making sure that we're also taking on China in those settings. And so I do think it's working well now, but we want to stay in close contact with industry, make sure we know what we need to do out there. Okay. Um, do you have any recommendations on how the United States process to get a unified domestic position can be improved? Any any insights well, thus far? I, I will say this is my first World Radio Conference, so while we've got great staff who are working on it, I, I, it's too early for me to tell. I would really be happy to get back to you and think about it uh, as we're progressing through it. So far, the process has been working well. Like I say, we're working collegially uh, uh, within, the f within the federal system, but we are hearing a lot and talking all the time with private sector stakeholders because their needs are a huge part of what we need to represent out there. Okay, well, great. Well, th thank you, and again, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the ability to wave on. The gentleman yields. Seeing there are no further members wishing to be recognized, I would like to thank our witness today for being here. I ask unanimous consent to insert in the record the documents included on the staff hearing documents list. Without objection, that will be the order. Without objection, so ordered. I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record, and I ask the witnesses to respond to the questions promptly. Members should submit their questions by the close of business on Wednesday, June 7th. Without objection, the subcommittee is adjourned. Thank you.